Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, you know, I realized, like I was telling uh, these folks earlier, it's pretty cold out, so you know, thanks for, for weathering, uh, no pun intended, the cold is coming. Um, so for today, I'm going to start with a relatively short kind of high level presentation. Um, I think the goal is more to give you a sense of some of these types of projects that we've been uh, working on. Um, which I think should set kind of a context for um, the tutorial. Um, and um, so I'll talk about exactly um, what I mean when I talk about um, last mile errors um, and what kinds of settings we can fix these, um, or that we've explored fixing these automatically. Um, is that not so slice? Uh, big, 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 big. Oh, cool. All right. So the first thing this is like work with a ton of people. Um, so I should, you know, I, I'd be remiss not not to mention these uh, folks. Um, a lot of the team uh, that I work with um, doesn't just work on program repair. Um, so there's a lot of um, other developer tools and kind of intelligent features at Microsoft that they're uh, involved with um, in a lot of popular consumer platforms. So you know, Excel. Uh, if you've used anything from the Power Platform, um, some VS Code and Visual Studio tools, um, a lot of these people are uh, behind a lot of those kind of nice um, synthesis-based features. Cool. Um, so for a while, we were trying to figure out kind of a good term to classify a lot of the mistakes we want to fix automatically. Um, and then we came on this kind of nice um, analogy with um, a problem in transportation, right? Where you have last mile delivery problems where you're kind of almost all the way there and you're missing kind of the last, literally the last mile to get to where you are. Um, and it turns out these problems actually happen a lot in practice for people, um, both developers, but also particularly for people who are uh, put in a position where they need a program, but they're not actual professional developers. Um, and so if you look at a lot of these uh, questions that people post on forums like Stack Overflow, very often uh, you'll find cases where uh, most of the program is actually right, and they have some small issue, right? And I think a lot of things are kind of like basic syntax errors or type mistakes, um, you know, calling the wrong function that has a similar name. A lot of this kind of pops up uh, over and over in pretty much most languages you could uh, think of. Um, and so the idea is, you know, can we fix these automatically? Um, and here's some examples that aren't actually showing the way they should be showing. Oh, no, here we go. So the top line for each language is kind of a buggy program um, in different uh, languages. So in Excel formulas, people tend to make mistakes because they're, uh, you know, they can get pretty nested. People who write them aren't necessarily developers. Um, PowerFX is another language uh, used. Uh, it's kind of also formula-like. Um, it's used to um, write kind of behavior interactions for, um, uh, power apps and power platform, which are these kind of offerings so people can build apps without actually having to, to write code. Uh, but some of the behavior you have to customize, so in the end, you still have to write these kind of small post visits. And then uh, PowerShell. Um, and so all of these have kind of small mistakes that if you are familiar with the languages, you could probably spot pretty quickly. Um, or even if you're not familiar with the languages, but you have general programming experience. Um, so, for example, the first uh, Excel formula, you know, they happen to miss these two parentheses to close off this nested uh, if expression. Um, and sometimes this can take kind of people a substantial amount of time. Uh, the lack of kind of editor support really doesn't help either. Um, and so part of the work we've been doing is to do kind of automatically fix that. Um, languages like PowerFX, there's Kind of common mistakes you see over and over. Uh, people who happen to have some programming experience but get confused about what operators might be like in this specific language. Um, so in this case, they use the wrong operator for comparison. Uh, and people who might not be aware, for example, that this J unit merge command actually takes uh, an array of uh, string arguments rather than a single string. So you kind of have to make these uh, fixes for, for their uh, little code snippets to actually run. Right. Um, and so I think the natural um, question is like, what can we build uh, to fix this? Um, and I think there's kind of a, you know, there's a, a whole spectrum of solutions. Um, and I think we've, we've started kind of thinking about this as two kind of extremes and trying to find design points in the middle um, where you have symbolic systems, um, where you spend a substantial amount of time engineering things like rewrite rules, checks, uh, you know, maybe some program analysis to figure out what exactly is going wrong. Um, 
and it has some advantages. Like I can actually tell someone why we fixed something some way, um, but it takes a lot of engineering effort. Um, and on the other end are these kind of neural methods where, you know, I think Omar had a nice cartoon yesterday where you just kind of shove in a bunch of data and you mix it around and out comes up a repair, a repair system that is actually kind of surprisingly good. Um, but you have to retrain it for new domains. Um, you have to collect data to be able to do that training. Um, and every time a uh, user comes with a new setting you don't cover, you have to figure out uh, a good way to cover it. Uh, either acquire new data and fine tuning on that or doing something you know, clever with the data you already have. Um, and then there's kind of neural symbolic systems in, in the middle that the idea is we can kind of blend some of these advantages uh, of, of both systems. Right. And so I think the question for us is there's already, you know, for different languages out there and these types of mistakes, there's different systems. Um, our team built a framework to uh, write these kinds of repair engines for um, these kind of formula style uh, languages, uh, which for, for Microsoft are, are pretty important. Um, there are neural systems for languages like uh, Python, uh, for C, uh, for JavaScript errors. Um, but I think the question is, you know, if you want to build a new system for another language, say for PowerShell or like your next favorite language, potentially your own, um, you know, how, how could you actually approach this? Um, so part of the goal today and the tutorial is to kind of, I think, give people a sense of how you could approach this problem. Um, I think rather than give you a solution, just walk through um, kind of a full, you know, very compressed research workflow, right? From like acquiring data, preparing it, metrics you might want to measure, um, a couple of different systems that could become kind of baselines for you. Um, and then really kind of a lot of uh, points that can be extended. So hopefully people can kind of hack on it uh, during the tutorial time and then we can uh, discuss or if people want to talk about it offline, that also works. Um, so I'll talk about, in the first part of the presentation, I'll talk about a couple of systems we've already worked on um, that kind of cover different parts of this problem. Um, and I think one kind of question for us was, could we take advantage of a lot of these um, language models that are trained on code uh, to mitigate some of these issues I talked about where you have to invest a lot of uh, engineering efforts if you want to build a symbolic system uh, or you have to invest a lot of time and also training effort uh, to build a custom neural system. Um, and so uh, this is kind of a very high level overview of a, a recent uh, project um, where we basically take uh, a language model and we just treat kind of code completion or generation tasks as, as repair. Um, and it works surprisingly well um, across different languages, um, even things that you wouldn't expect are uh, particularly present in its training data. Um, so the general setup um, in this problem is you have some example bank um, for kind of related uh, programs in that language with mistakes that you might expect to actually encounter in practice. Uh, when you encounter a buggy program, um, you basically feed in uh, examples of other fixes, some information about the error localization um, you get some completions and then you can rank these. Um, and the ranking for us turned out to be fine if it was pretty simple, um, but there's actually some work that I, I have in, and I'll show some sites at the end of the tutorial um, that has done some really nice work uh, around actually training custom rankers uh, for uh, code tasks with language models. Actually, Giovanna, one of our Mondo's former students, uh, led that work uh, at MSR, which is, uh, which is a very nice project. Um, so, uh, just a quick question. So, ranking over here, do you find it to be like an important step? Yeah. So, I think so. What we notice is for a lot of, especially for popular languages, what you end up with is um, a lot of models can actually solve the task if you sample kind of enough solutions uh, early on. But if you could prioritize some of them rather than check all of them okay. or guide the decoding process, that would actually help a lot rather than have to generate all of them and check them. Um, so it does seem to matter. Um, and, and these are complex enough bugs where, like I imagine like the parenthesis completion should be like an obvious. Uh, this. Yeah, so sometimes it actually, so, okay. So one of the things is I think I want to caveat that, especially for things like, um, like if you're evaluating with something like Codex, um, their behavior changes over time, sure. uh, right? As they improve the model. Sure. Um, and at least at some point in the past, um, 
not for general purpose languages, but if you go to something like Excel, it actually had a very hard time <coughs> doing things like balancing parentheses. Um, and so I think, so I won't talk about that work here, but one of our points was why have a model balance parentheses when you just, we know how to do that anyways. Yeah. And so the idea is you can kind of pair different phases, one where you do some amount of symbolic stuff, you know how to manipulate the structure and only rely on the model uh, in cases where you um, can't actually do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two questions. So, so you do this analysis after you get the error message? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you retrieve. So the setup here is you have this the person's buggy code. Um, you can kind of do whatever you want on it. You might just recite it right. And in this case, like the Python parser, and you get some mistake, right? And you have the error message, and you have a kind of a collection of prior programs along with their error messages. And so you can retrieve programs that have some similar error message. And that similarity could be you embed the two error messages and compute some cosine similarity, or you could do something else. But that, that works pretty well. And, and to what extent uh, this method generalizes without the error message? Um, like just you, like just consider the ranking. Um, yeah, so the error message can be pretty important. I think it's important for different languages to different extents. Um, so for example, in, um, Excel formulas where a lot of it is like a single line and they're just quite wide. Um, it doesn't seem to help as much. It doesn't seem like the model can actually navigate and like know um, if you give it a column offset, it won't necessarily make a repair where you want it to. I mean, you can kind of scope it down and just give it that part and hope it actually does the right thing and put it back in. Um, but I would say it does matter, but for different languages, it's different. Uh, it's pretty empirical. I would say, yeah. So I would say this isn't like a, like there's some fundamental understanding for why, except for you know you could imagine that people all of the code that you train on might have comments referring to things like you know fix online whatever, especially in things like uh, commit messages, right? Um, so I mean in general I'd say for all these systems our view is you you kind of you collect a benchmark set and then you evaluate and make changes pretty much guided by performance. Uh, <coughs> and kind of hypothesize a couple of things that might work, uh, but at the end of the day, you're kind of evaluating all of them. Um, so, so just to like give you a sense of how, uh, like what we found kind of trying this out. Um, so we compared um, this kind of relatively simple workflow I showed to uh, tools that were developed for specific languages. Um, so on the left-hand side, um, I have three languages, Excel, Python, and C. Um, and I think what's kind of neat to see is that, you know, basically taking advantage of some of these larger models, um, you can do better, you know, in some cases by a pretty big margin, the systems that were built just for that language. Um, I mean, La Mirage, for example, is our repair tool for Excel, and that was like a substantial amount of engineering work. Um, there's also a neural component, but it was it was like a lot of effort from multiple people, um, and we got the Excel version of this tool running in like two days. Um, so I think the main point is, especially for people who are building their own uh, languages and who want kind of ha to have repair uh, functionality um, for these types of mistakes, um, there's kind of a big opportunity to, to use uh, uh, larger language models. Um, yeah, for other languages, didn't do as well. Um, so PowerShell actually did atrociously. Um, we don't have a good sense for why that is. So if you look at things like the average log probability for um, repairs that are uh, correct in PowerShell, it's kind of like all over the place. And some of the other languages, repairs that are right are indeed kind of have a higher log prob. Um, and so the ranking we did make sense, um, but even if you forget about ranking and just look at like the top 50 candidates, um, there really weren't that many for PowerShell. Um, so one of the kind of the ideas is it might be an issue with just how much PowerShell um, you would see uh, during training. Um, so we do have some experiments we're working on where we actually uh, fine tune a um, smaller version of the model, not, not, not the full uh, 175 billion parameter model. Um, but um, yeah, so far we have not finished those, so it's not clear yet if that'll help, but it should help some.
Um, yeah, like I mentioned before, basically, I think the big takeaway here is you can have a pretty high performing uh, repair tool for, for this type of mistakes in like one or two days at most. Um, it's actually quite fast to, to build. Um, cool. So in that project, we used um, uh, one of the uh, codex models. And I mean, even the smaller ones are still like 12 billion parameters. Um, and so the question is, you know, if we, particularly in our case, if we're working with kind of a simpler domain specific language, like why do we need to use this? And like, should we? Um, right. So, you know, the advantage is if you take some of these original models, first they're, you know, they're around. So that's, that's always kind of nice to at least try out. Um, but they're huge, uh, which means they're costly to actually train and deploy. Um, so, you know, even as a, like a researcher, getting kind of resources to run some of these experiments can, can, can be kind of a, a, a hassle. Um, and it kind of makes sense that they're that big and that they're trained on, on that much code, because the idea is they're supposed to be um, useful across tasks and across languages, uh, right? But if you're uh, trying to do things, say, just in Excel uh, or in other formula-like languages, it's not clear that you um, couldn't just do something a lot simpler. Um, and it turns, it turns out you can. Um, and with performance, that's pretty competitive, um, which I think it shouldn't be surprising, but I think what is interesting is you can't just toss random Excel formulas and hope it, hope it works. Um, you actually have to do a little bit more um, to get things to actually work out. Um, and so we built this model called, we called it Flame. We thought it was clever. It turns out there's a bunch of systems called Flame. Mm -hmm. um, um, we mainly called it Flame, I think, because of the formula part and because it would let us have an emoji as an icon for it. Uh, we didn't actually end up using the emoji, um, but it's, you know, substantially smaller to 60 million parameters. Uh, it's trained on like less than a gigabyte of formulas. Um, and it's basically small enough that you could conceivably uh, deploy it uh, kind of at scale uh, without having to set up a bunch of infrastructure. Um, so some of the tasks, so, I mean, this is kind of relevant to this workshop mainly because of the repair portion, uh, but we do use it for a couple of other things. Um, so auto completion, uh, you, you know, I think everyone can imagine you're typing a formula and you'd like to get the rest of it just uh, suggested to you. Um, and then we have this kind of synthetic task, but I think it's interesting because it does require um, kind of some understanding of syntax uh, and the structure of formulas. And we call it syntax reconstruction, but the idea is you take an original formula, you remove kind of all the delimiters, so you just have this flat stream of tokens and you have to reconstruct uh, the formula, right? So you kind of have to figure, have to have to kind of remember uh, function arities, right? Like does uh, VLOOKUP take three, four, five arguments? Um, you might have to figure out some functions can be uh, can have mul can, can have multiple arities, so you might have to uh, I don't want to say reason, but you might have to correlate the uh, types of certain tokens, you know, is this like a string literal, then it certainly, you know, can't be in one function as in the next function call. Um, and so there's, I think, some kind of interesting things you have to capture. But is this how you, is this part of your training objective? Uh, no, I'll talk about, I'll talk about training objectives, mm -hmm. but this is kind of one of the uh, downstream yeah. tasks uh, to evaluate on. Um, yeah, the syntax reconstruction task came up because we wanted to have this like very sloppy way of programming where people don't need to worry about anything. They just yeah. kind of like, stream of consciousness kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's not entirely clear that that's useful as much in practice, but it's close enough to the repair uh, task that we, but it's close enough that it could be useful and different enough that we figured we should split out for uh, evaluation. And this is customized fully for Excel? Yes. Um, yeah, or maybe Excel like syntax. Yeah, or Excel like syntax. So I think you could do the same tricks uh, for other languages. We did Excel because it's just like a big yeah. platform. Yeah. Um, and so basically the setup here was collected. There's actually quite a big um, Excel corpus uh, that's been collected from public uh, websites. Um, and we've used it in a couple of projects. Um, it, it, it is going to be open source. The different team uh, worked on that. So I think that'll be quite neat. Um, so I think if people are interested, it is substantially larger than uh, existing uh, Excel formula or Excel workbook corpora out there. Um, it's not just formulas, it's basically workbooks. So, you know, you have graphs, you have uh, conditional formatting, you have kind of whatever people might do. 
Um, and so our setup was, so we, we kind of collected a fair amount of those workbooks from this bigger corpus. Um, we have to curate, and I'll talk about the curation for a specific uh, setup for uh, how we can actually create free training data. Um, we have some domain specific free training objectives I'll talk about. Um, from that, we get flame. Uh, and then we can also derive some fine tuning data uh, for the different tasks uh, from the same kind of public uh, workbooks. Um, yeah, so in this case, um, the kind of, I think the key idea was you can make the model smaller because you're in a kind of more restricted domain, but it also means to get it to work, you should incorporate some domain knowledge into the actual training. Um, and so the different pre-training objectives we have um, are shared with other kind of standard language model uh, pre-training objectives, but rather than just have them be generic, we have some variants that are uh, specific to uh, our language. And I think the idea is, if you look at things like Code T5, um, some of their pre-training objectives also start to bring in the idea of you're not just dealing with text, you're dealing with programs, you can do a little bit more. Um, and so I think it's the same idea, but kind of applied to now at the domain level, where if you know you're in Excel, you can do things that are uh, custom to that, right? And so kind of, I think one, the, the, so the two um, domain specific ones are at, at, uh, in green on opposite ends of the slide. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have uh, what we call kind of language aware span masking. So in traditional span masking, you might just pick some contiguous set of uh, a sequence of uh, tokens and just mask them out. Um, and then uh, at training time, the goal is to uh, uh, recover the values that were uh, masked up. Um, kind of the issue, <coughs> if you just do that randomly, is um, at least uh, for our case, you might end up uh, masking um, parts of uh, things like function names, but not the whole thing. Um, and when you actually train that way, uh, we found to be found performance to be pretty bad. Like it might be that if you scaled up the data set, that, that kind of gets around it. But a way to get the same performance with a smaller data set was to make sure um, these span masks uh, didn't uh, break uh, uh, language lexer uh, boundaries. So if you're going to mask part of a, a function name, you're going to mask the whole thing. If you're going to mask a, a cell reference, um, you have to mask. Uh, I think a self reference is the whole thing. Um, there's some qualified references to reference like specific workbooks and things. Um, so you have to do some, some things there as well. Um, the other goal, which I think is maybe more interesting for, for this workshop uh, on uh, repair is the idea of, um, so some language models train with these like denoising um, uh, objectives, um, which is kind of related to the uh, masking, but not quite. So the idea is you corrupt your input sequence in some way and you have to uh, recover the uncorrupted version. Um, and so the idea here is, you know, you can always do that randomly, but why not do it in ways um, that actually reflect the kind of noise you would see in, in practice, right? So the, the ultimate goal of the model is to be able to use it for repair. Um, so when you're pre-training on just noisy uh, denoising, you can also start to kind of bring in some, um, some of those concepts, even if they're synthetic. Uh, and so what we did is we basically looked through a fair amount of um, sources. So kind of like user forums, um, internal uh, um, logging. Um, so there's certain circumstances under which you, as long as you collect anonymized uh, logs, you can, uh, for Microsoft employees, you can uh, get information on not the exact formula, but the structures of the formulas of the writing. Um, and people tend to make pretty kind of uh, recurring mistakes. Uh, and so we basically turned each of those or the more popular types of mistakes into uh, noise operators. Um, and so then when we're pre-training, we basically can randomly apply one of these or multiple of these break formulas and produce um, more kind of domain specific uh, uh, noise uh, sequences. Cool. Um, so this is some evaluation. Um, so I won't go into the details here. I don't think it's that kind of, uh, it might be a little too much for, for here, but I think the, the goal is simply, you know, our models on the bottom side, uh, bottom line, it's not always uh, the top score, right? So bold is, is the best, uh, but it's certainly competitive with models that are substantially uh, larger. Um, and for some weird tasks like syntax reconstruction, which you don't really expect some of these models to, to do well, because 
A, it's a weird task, and, and B, it's in a domain they're not, uh, they don't have a ton of training data on, uh, in this case, Excel languages, you know, we do substantially better. Um, I think interesting here is uh, Cushman, the top model, we, we did fine tune for all these tasks. Um, so in this case, actually, it wasn't pre-trained on Excel uh, data, but it certainly was fine tuned for all these tests with the same fine tuning data we used. Um, and um, so, you know, we kind of outperformed that. Uh, da Vinci is essentially larger, 175 billion parameters. We do not, as of now, have resources to fine tune that. Um, so, you know, I think eventually, but I think that is, um, it's unclear, especially like if it would be worth it, you'd probably have to fine tune in substantially more data anyways. Um, so I think for now, the, the results here are based on, on a few shots, so providing examples in the, <coughs> in the prompt. Um, and the code T5 numbers are, so code T5 is a T5 model. It's been uh, further trained on natural language and code pairs. Um, and then we fine tune it for, for our tasks and there's two variant sizes. Um, and then again, for the most part, we were either competitive or, or outperforming it. Uh, well, being smaller. So, 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 like the best sort of competing model over here is Code T5 60 million, if I understand it right. Because right? um, it's similar size, yeah. Similar size, yep. uh, but fine tuned. So, I'm wondering if if these, let's say, T81 improvements of like, let's say, 0.81 to 0.89, yep. those are like significant jumps, at least from like a product standpoint, which uh, Excel would care about. Yeah. So, what I'm, that, that's a good point. So what I'm not showing here, so we are better period at auto completion. Um, nice. And I think that is probably a useful, uh, a useful task that you would care about performance. But yeah, there's a good point that, you know, with code T5, you get similar performance, but if you're getting similar performance in the same size and right. there's still an improvement, there's not a huge argument not to right. uh, deploy this one. Um, I mean, in all cases, um, kind of, I think a big uh, challenge for these features is um, latency. Um, and so we haven't really even addressed that here, except for the fact that, you know, we're certainly, inference is certainly faster on the 60 million than the 22 million, uh, 20 million. Uh, but we haven't invested time in that yet. Um, I think that is probably more what would, like if you have two models that have roughly the same uh, performance and size, if you can engineer one uh, to be lower latency, that would be probably the winning factor. And, and flame over here is also uh, fine tuned on these tasks? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so everything except Da Vinci is fine tuned for these right. tasks. Um, yeah. So, uh, are you, what kind of cluster are you using to train this? Or? Um, so, we have, um, so actually, we put the paper up on the archive a couple of days ago and we have an acknowledgement section. So, let me just try to recall exactly. Who gave us what? So, will you use uh, like Azure and all these cloud computing? We no, we have some internal uh, AMD cluster. So this is actually an AMD, um, um, which is so we have like MI two fifties, I think, which I think are like similar to A one hundreds, maybe something like that. Do um, you have any limits on like the computer you can use? Or? E, well, so it's a shared cluster, so we have to kind of be good good citizens uh, and. Be respectful. Um, so our yeah, I, I mean our, our approach has typically been we try to run as many kind of small scale experiments as we can. Um, if we start to think it has legs, then we will uh, run experiments on on this AMD cluster, um, and then we'll kind of pick the best setup. And for example, for something like Cushman, uh, that does take a lot of resources to fine tune. Uh, we'll basically try to kind of prune out things that we feel aren't going to work out at all uh, and really just try the ones that look more promising. Um, but that's not like a, I mean, uh, it's like an internal group thing we've tried to set up so we don't have people uh, just running Christian fine tuning experiments like every day. Um, yeah. Another question here. Yeah. Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. How did the other models perform on only detection? Yeah, that's like just figuring out where the mistake is and not fixing it. Yeah, that, so we didn't do that for this paper. Um, we do have, and that would actually probably be a pretty good comparison to extend this with. Um, we did a different paper. Um, so the one I presented before, Ring, 
Um, and in towards the end, there's a comparison where we look at a, it varied by language there. And for some languages, it was in this, this case that it did localize things well, but it didn't make the right change. Um, I think there's an opportunity for doing stuff, but uh, okay, so let me also backtrack. I think there's cases where if you can do localization with like a traditional like book localization approach, that probably makes more sense. And then what we did in a different project was we augmented those locations with uh, predictions from a pointer network. Um, and it was particularly useful for places where, where you realize there's a mistake is pretty far away from where you have to make an edit. Um, and they were basically more like syntax uh, bugs, these kind of last mile mistakes that we call. Um, and I think the canonical example I give people is, um, it, it's related to parentheses, but say you forgot an opening parentheses, right? You're probably only gonna realize that once you hit the kind of parent closing parentheses. And now you could have a bunch of places to uh, explore. Um, and so in those cases, um, we did find it was pretty useful to just try to predict the location uh, and then that worked pretty well. And then you'd make an edit there rather than kind of have to backtrack and explore a bunch of places. Thanks. Um, yeah, so this is an archive. Um, it was also on Hacker News, which is kind of fun. I think people, I was kind of shocked that people would kind of pay that much attention to random archive uh, uploads. Um, but, you know, you can take a look. Maybe don't read the comments. People are being very, <laughs> being very hacker newsy and complaining about like the formula language. I'm like, well, it's not like we're going to redesign it. Uh, it's not under our, it's not, probably not going to happen. Uh, actually, well, I mean, there is some new uh, stuff with um, lambdas for uh, Excel. So it's really neat. So if you haven't used that, you should probably try, check it out. Um, Sorry, how am I doing on time? Okay, so I have two more things I want to talk about before we move on to the um, actual kind of hands-on tutorial. Um, and they're still kind of all related, right? So this is just hopefully giving you kind of like an overview. So a different project um, with uh, one of our interns this past summer. Um, and here we kind of shifted gears a little bit. And our goal was to fix not just like the syntax and kind of type mistakes, but also um, have some kind of functional correctness with respect to test cases. Um, and it was <clears throat> for student assignments. Um, so we have a um, data set from a collaborator in India who ran a intro Python programming course. Um, and students uh, would submit their uh, assignment solutions through a platform. Um, and uh, as part of that, you know, you got to run test cases and then they kind of collected um, uh, programs uh, that the students submitted. Um, and so these programs might have, again, like parsing issues or other types of uh, errors, not just they failed case, test cases. Um, and so the, the task was, you know, could you kind of, again, uh, fix these uh, in some kind of automated fashion while taking advantage of all the things that you have because you're in an education setup, right? Um, and so I think that's kind of like the neat part of this project that you have all these things you would never have in real developer set settings, right? You, you know, you might have like a task description, sure, like somewhere, somewhere, someone has written probably a little blurb about what they're trying to do. Uh, you probably have test cases, uh, but things like peer programs that are solving the exact same task, like, you know, probably not. Uh, otherwise, if you're a professional developer, you'd probably just rip out that code and use that and would like, hopefully wouldn't re-implement it yourself. Um, but in the student setting, uh, you know, this happens all the time, right? You have other students in the class solving the same problem. Um, and you as a uh, instructor or a TA um, would hopefully like some assistance in providing feedback to the students, right? It can be kind of pretty time consuming to sit down and kind of try to spot the bug in every student's mistakes uh, and every student's solutions. Um, and you could probably like set up some common classes and, and stuff of things people make mistakes in. But at the end of the day, like there's a lot of ways to make mistakes. Right. Um, and so the idea here was, you know, can we again kind of rely on, on one of these large language models um, to repair these student uh, uh, submissions? And, and here the repair uh, criteria is, you know, you have to pass whatever test cases your instructor has assigned. Um, and so I think I, all I wanted to share here was this kind of general architecture that we found to be pretty useful, um, where you kind of address things in, in stages. So you have one stage where you try to fix any uh, syntax issue, um, and you can do this kind of iteratively until you can, can converge on a program that doesn't have any issues or you know, you're done and you don't actually get to move to the next phase. 
Um, and the next phase, you actually start trying to fix the uh, test case failures because you can actually run the program now. Um, and I think the kind of the interesting part is the part, the type of information you'd use for each phase. Uh, you know, maybe unsurprisingly, it varies. Um, so things like test cases aren't going to be that helpful for your first phase if you can't really even run your program. Um, but even like if you just try to include them, let's say in your prompt, uh, it doesn't actually help very much. In fact, sometimes it actually destructs uh, and produces um, the wrong solutions. Um, so yeah, and I think the final part is, like I mentioned, the student setting, you have uh, other people's programs who've been solving the same test. Um, and so the idea is you can retrieve some of those examples to include into your prompt um, in kind of a smarter way than just say randomly. Um, so for example, I think one of the things we, we did eventually that was, that was useful was take other programs with similar failure uh, cases, right? So if you take the test cases um, and you pick programs that have, uh, that pass some, that, uh, a set that is similar to your set that you pass and fail a set that is similar to the set that you fail, um, then it's very possible that within those examples, there'll be somebody who has the same type of mistake that you do, right? So I don't think that's particularly like that's something people have done in other uh, program repair uh, work, uh, but it's kind of nice to see that it uh, works here as well. All right, so it's a ton of numbers, so I, I don't really want to dwell too much on it. Um, I think what's maybe more interesting is just the last two, the last, hmm, the second to last comment column at the bottom, the 67.13, and the uh, mapper, you know, 96.50 or 86.71 at the beginning. Um, so what we did is we took um, some number, you know, add up those numbers of uh, student submissions uh, across different problems. Some of them are simpler, some of them are harder. Um, and we tried to solve them uh, with our pipeline, with uh, peer kind of examples, uh, and without peer examples. You know, un unsurprisingly, having peer examples really improves performance. Um, and then we compare this to using two uh, custom tools for Python. Um, so by five, break it, fix it is um, and I'll talk about it a little bit in the tutorial, is a uh, um, Python syntax and type error uh, repair system uh, based on uh, its trans the transformer-based model. Um, and Refactory um, is built to fix uh, buggy Python student programs, like it's built for the EDU setting. Um, it's actually quite clever. Like it basically takes a um, buggy student program and it has say like a reference solution from the instructor and it basically rewrites the control flow in the buggy student program to make it more similar to the reference solution. Um, and it does that by kind of inserting no op branches and um, a lot of kind of, basically it doesn't change the semantics of the program but it does change kind of the structure of it. Um, and then it kind of lines up the two uh, control flow graphs from the reference solution and the rewritten student buggy program um, and it basically performs kind of line level, block level repairs. Um, so I think it's kind of this nice idea as well of taking advantage of a solution that you're already aware of to improve uh, a buggy program. Um, and in their case, um, a lot of the failures come from cases where um, the reference solution and the student program is very different. And so it doesn't really matter how many rewrites you perform, you can't really align the graphs very well. Um, and so you just fail to produce programs. Um, other cases you have um, not incorrect repairs because that's not BiFi's like spec, but BiFi will make edits that will make it satisfy like syntax and type checks, but will make it harder to actually fix the test case failures. Because for example, it might delete a whole statement um, and then Refactor will be kind of unable to synthesize that missing statement. Sorry, the last, I think this is the last thing. Yes, okay, cool. Um, so I just want to talk about, so we've been talking about like producing repairs. Um, I think a part that's important, um, and certainly the closer <coughs> we get to shipping some of these repair tools, um, I think the more we are thinking about it is how, like, how do you actually explain some of these fixes to users? Um, sharing a setting, in this case, what I'll talk about is you're in a setting with users who are say students, um, who maybe don't have the, the, the background to look at the, just the buggy program, the fixed program would be like a hi, you know, I learned something, I understood. Um, and then the product setting, 
you know, if you give someone who is having issues writing Excel formulas and you give them an Excel formula fix, it's like unclear that they'll even know whether it's the right thing to do or not, right? So I think explaining uh, some of these repairs is, is pretty important for, for us personally uh, in our group, um, but I think it's also kind of an interesting uh, problem uh, for research more broadly. Um, so this is a project, a collaboration we have with, with um, Adish Singh Lau's group at uh, Max Planck Institute. Um, and the task there is um, in the education setting to not just generate these fixes that I was going to show you before, uh, but actually ex uh, explain them uh, to the user, uh, right? That the students, so they actually kind of take something away from it. Um, and so here are like examples of a, uh, the left column is like buggy uh, Python programs from a student. The second column uh, is uh, repairs that are generated uh, automatically. Uh, the third column are explanations for those repairs that are also generated automatically. And the fourth column is basically an illustration of our uh, validation procedure. Um, because basically the core idea is you want to make sure you're not providing an explanation that's wrong, right? Um, I think what can be kind of tricky is you might also have cases actually where the fix is right, but the explanation is wrong. And so there's a bunch of kind of ways this can, can go awry. Um, and so I, I won't touch too much on like exactly how it's done, except to, to think we're putting up a paper it's under submission now, but I, I think it should be an archive. So, um, so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to share a little bit more detail later. But the idea is um, we want to make sure that when we surface to the user, we're re relatively confident that the good explanation. Um, and like the very high level approach of this is um, it's basically built on this idea of kind of back translation and consistency. Um, and so the idea is if I give you, if say if you're a model and you generated a fix, and now I give you just the fix and the buggy program and you generate an explanation. If I now go in the other direction where I take the buggy program and the explanation, you should be able to resynthesize the fix, right? And if that fix is very different from what you originally told me, one of the two is probably gonna be wrong. Either the fix or the explanation, um, we won't know which, but we're certainly not gonna show that to anybody. Um, and so there's some parameters you can calibrate um, to kind of, basically make sure you satisfy some precision goals. Um, so I think it's another important part where you're basically, we're willing to tolerate some cases of incorrect feedback, uh, but we wanna cap that. And so it is if, as long as you allow for some over, uh, the, the parameter basically lets you determine how, much, how strict you wanna be about this kind of back translation. Um, and so if you set it, so for example, you're willing to say, I want this back translation to be precise in 70% of the cases, you set some hyperparameters. Um, and then we tried it on a couple of uh, real data sets, um, both from competitive programming and then from a, a Python class carried out by a, a collaborator. I believe it was in the German, in the German uh, university. Um, I think what's kind of just good to kind of see is so A, you know, the, light, the line highlighted in green is substantially higher than all the other lines, which is you know, great, except for the last one, which is this kind of theoretical uh, optimum uh, given the, uh, the uh, precision cutoff we, we chose. Um, and so you get precise feedback. Um, the challenge, you know, that I think is pretty clear here, uh, especially for the first data set is that the coverage, so how many students you actually give feedback to is, is still not that high, right? So that's something we have to kind of work on uh, to improve. Uh, but the first portion is, is certainly very encouraging where, um, you know, if we surface something to the users, we have a reasonable uh, confidence in this case, you know, let's say at least 70% of the cases, uh, we think that feedback should be uh, precise. So this table here, so the left hand side, the part technique, um, we pick hyperparameters kind of automatically based on, on a validation set. The right hand side of the table, you know, from Tiger Jack and Code Forces are all uh, manual annotation. So that's kind of like, you know, one of the difficulties may be of this research area for explanations that at the end of the day, it is a lot of like subjective uh, validation. So we have to have multiple annotators, you know, go through a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of feedback, uh, you know, thank you to the uh, MPI PhD students who are doing that. Um, and then do kind of traditional kind of inner annotator agreement and so on. Uh, just a quick question. So uh, the kinds of repairs that are happening over here, uh, if you could go back to mm -hmm. the previous slide. So, is there like a taxonomy of sorts that you folks have figured out as to what the class of repairs really are? Because these seem to be 
slightly more like I would say in the scale of things, slightly simpler to at least as a human to figure out what's going yes. on. Yes. But there could be, I could imagine, like slightly more non-obvious, like let's say an entire else case is missing in, in one of the solutions. Or uh, binary hasn't been yep. uh, recursively implemented and has been like rolled out. And the repair or like refactor is really to suggest that, yeah, you could probably write this. I would say that other. one is out of scope for sure. I, um, I think there are interesting things. Uh, one of the challenges actually when you use something like Codex is like constraining it to make sure it doesn't do that second one. And yeah. very often, uh, and then in the tutorial, I have an example where it fixes an issue, but also rewrites a function. In fact, it rewrites and fixes a bug, which is kind of great, but right. not what I wanted it to do. Sure. Um, I would say this is these are probably about the complexity uh, of things we're fixing with this. Um, maybe some more things. There are some non-obvious. Actually, there's some very non-obvious things. They're not obvious to people who don't know Python, but like right. mixes of tabs and space, which sounds oh, really yeah, annoying, yeah, but yeah. it happens to students all the time. So I think that's the other point that you have to kind of like re-index on the people who are sure, uh, sure. using this and it's sure. students. Sure. Um, and so common things tend to be uh, using wrong operators, mm. um, the uh, confusion of what can be assigned to. So people might have like expressions sure. as assignment targets. Sure. Um, you know, nesting, they definitely get wrong. Slightly different indentations, they get wrong. Um, it will also be an interesting baseline to just translate a bad error message into something of this sort mm -hmm. and see whether that itself is like a good enough fix. So, like fix suggestion. so we didn't do that, but one of our collaborators, Tobias um, Kuhn, Kuhn I, I should know how to pronounce it, but I apologize, I don't. Um, he um, had a prior project where that was his, his thing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, where he basically uh, just bolted on better, it was not just better explanations, he did a little bit more than that, but basically just like catch Python exceptions, rewrite them with some templates and maybe extract a couple more things from the program to like clarify yeah. um, and have like suggested default fixes. Yeah. Um, and it helped, but I don't think it helped that much. That being said, Python uh, error messages are getting better. Like, sure. I don't know if you've seen this. Like, I think it's been a very concerted effort from oh, the, uh, from, from, from the core developers to, yeah. to improve uh, all, messages, all, which is great. Or we could use language models in the sense that have like few error messages, few like hand annotated like descriptions of it. Yes. And then get the model to like really appreciate like what the translation is from going from like a bad message to a good message. Yeah, so there's, so I think this gets, so that's a good point. So here we do have few shots. Some of them are manipulated. Some of them are more like template based sure. generation. Yeah. But I think the idea of getting it to rewrite bad messages to good messages is, is interesting. Um, yeah, so here the definition of good is, is I mean, it's still, actually, actually I won't say it's subjective. The, the paper has like a very clear criteria of things it needs to mention. Sure. Um, it has to cover, I believe, the location. Right. Has to be. It has to make, make an explicit mention of the error and an explicit mention of the fix. It might even have to say like why this is necessary. Yeah. Um, so we generated a lot of the um, example set for a few shots and for some evaluation uh, manually. Um, in fact, for kind of because this is pretty tedious to. So for the final paper, a lot of evaluation manually, but it's very tedious to do for experiments. Um, so we did a lot of an annotation and then just have some, I know everyone hates blue as a metric, sure. but it's actually not like, I don't like, like it for presenting results, but I think it is good for iterating on experiments. Um, and so we had some of that. Uh, and I think what I realized is that at least for me, I could spot and explain the fix pretty quickly, right. but in some cases I would be stumped. Um, and so, and for some of those, we also have the time it took students. We, we, I don't think we talk about it in the paper, uh, but some of them are, are meaningful amounts of time. Yeah, no, because like big picture, I mean, all this effort seems to be just to get students to appreciate like uh, like what the message is and like what the compiler is trying to say and then like act on it. And this is like yeah. one way to go about it. Yeah. Probably fixing the error message itself, which yes. thankfully the code developers also are doing. And I think will likely make the task. Easier. So for the other program, right, like uh, the other project where we were with uh, here with um, Jalu, um, here explaining the bugs, like this is going to be a completely different setup, right? It's okay. not clear how hard or easy that would be. Sure. I mean, my guess is very hard. Sure. Um, but but we haven't done that yet. So right now, yeah, it's just for these kinds of mistakes. Sure. Cool. Um, 
Mine's not switching. Let me, oh, wait, did I? Yeah, okay, cool. So, so that's kind of like the talk portion, I guess. Um, <coughs> I have a question. Yeah. So you've been working on this since your PhD, right? I have not. No. So much to my advisor's chagrin, I actually refused to work on repair during my PhD. <laughs> um, and I think he finds it funny now. I'm not sure if he's pissed or not, maybe. <laughs> but I, I told him it wasn't like lost on me that I'm now doing the work he wanted me to do during my PhD. Uh, so this has been sense. Um, and so in some sense, actually, that's a little bit of my, like the focus, like, I, I kind of structured the tutorial almost like as a thing I wish I had had when I started doing this work. Mm -hmm. You kind of just like go from like zero to, you know, hero might not be the right level. We'll get to like 0.25 hero, but you know, we'll get far long enough that we can kind of hike around on it. Um, for, for that, um, for training that model, how much um, test cases did you um, train it with approximately? Um, th this like the explanation yeah. stuff? Yeah, so here we're not, so, this is a good point. So we're not fine tuning anything here. Um, this is just pure, like, just prompt based. Just, just using codex? Yeah, just using codex and just like prompt tacking around. Um, the core contribution here is more on the back, like the uh, idea of using back translation, or we're not calling it back translation because then it's confusing because you kind of have to go to the same domain. Um, but this kind of like back and forth as a way to validate uh -huh. the, the effects and the explanation. Uh -huh. so I would say that's the core. Um, I mean, you can fine tune. You probably could fine tune to generate explanations. Um, I think we didn't do it in this project yet because we did not have um, resources to fine tune Cushman, which we do have now. Uh -huh. um, so I think that might be something we, we revisit. Um, I mean, you probably need, uh, so uh, most of the fine tuning stuff we've done with something like Cushman, like we have on like the order of a couple hundred thousand examples. Um, I think you can try with less, but even for simple things, like it doesn't seem that good. Right. Um, and, and that result is about the explanation, right? What, what if yes. you don't care about the explanation and just the fix? Yeah, so I think there, there might be some results in the paper about that. Um, the fix part, we're just kind of like taking as, even if you, so we could probably improve the fix rate further, um, but we didn't really focus on it too much. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the paper, honestly, if I remember exactly what the success rate was. Um, but my guess is pretty high, right? Probably comparable to whatever this other number was. Uh, yeah, probably comparable to this like 94-ish. Um, Cause that's with codex uh, and it has some, like a couple of like tricks, but I would say something along, along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, actually, but who knows, right? So this is a, a different data set. So here we evaluated on the same data set that the by five people use or a sample. We use the same sample for both. Um, and so I would expect these to be simpler than the type of mistakes the students make. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, so one challenge I think with, uh, yeah, with students is um, sometimes their mistakes are easy. Sometimes like I, like I was saying, uh, Shashank, sometimes they're really hard. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would have to go back and look at the distribution of, 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 of mistakes in, 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 this, in the data set for the explanations. I see. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think there's another point, right, of like here we used um, codex, but the, the same procedure could be applied to other models, uh, including open source ones. So mm -hmm. we didn't do that evaluation. I think it's kind of, a, it would be a nice extension um, of the work. Um, I'm not sure. I think the MPI folks have a couple of other things lined up, so I'm not sure we'll, we'll get to that uh, anytime soon. Unless we get into it, so that'd be great. Any other questions on? Yeah, a technical one about inference. Yeah. Uh, how long it takes to infer to do inference? Yeah. So, especially with something like Codex, it's part of it is you're you're paying for network ping, right? Yeah. It's not even like the actual running of the model. Um, but your model is supposed to run like on Excel locally, yes, right? That, on like um, yeah, so that, uh, laptop, right? Uh, yeah, that one you could run on a laptop. Um, I think realistically, before you deploy it, we do a lot more work to try to reduce the model size. Um, I think like the ultimate, like what would be really beautiful is to have like a like something you could do client side, like for kind of Excel online people where you run the model and the client. 
right? And, and you could, like, I think if we get it small enough, um, we haven't done that at all. Um, I don't think, so for that paper, we really did not put any effort into like optimizing for inference, but you know, maybe a, a second or two, for example. So slow enough that you wouldn't want to do like a lot of real time suggestions, but fast enough that if, you know, especially for errors where like a user gets stuck and there's kind of like, what do I do now? Then you kind of have like a second or two to, of time anyways. Um, so is it realistic to uh, do inference for every character or if you have like some not 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 with this yeah um i'm not saying you couldn't do it if you put effort into it but i don't think you could grab that model like off the shelf today and do that um there's also some things like that we have to like study a little bit like we did run into some circumstances it wasn't with our model but with some of the other stuff where for completions you would actually successfully autocomplete given a shorter prefix, but then fail given a longer prefix, which is like not consistent, right? Like that should be in theory easier, um, but it happened in some weird cases. Um, so I think there's some more like work to do before using that kind of off the shelf. And yeah, performance wise, I, I probably wouldn't call it every character. I mean, you could call it like every like lexer bound, right? Like if the lexer produces a token, sure. But if the lexer fails to produce a token, say like you're you know, in between, like if you're if you have a malformed cell reference, then there's no point. Um, but you'd have to run the lexer constantly too. Thanks. So I don't know. Um, I mean, the compile tool chain is probably fast enough, but the model stuff I think would be would be a bottleneck. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess we can just kind of should we just dive in. Do you want to breathe, guys, or are you okay? Should we take like a quick break, like maybe five minutes? Yeah. Okay, let's let's do a quick five minute break. Um we'll be back. Thank <laughs> you. 
even it's so cold i even brought my long like ski underwear whoa i mean i took it off when i got into the building nice but... nice well, I mean, I just... it was okay it was like a 15 minute walk and i could feel my toes getting cold <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. It's smallish. Yeah. Uh, do you know where everybody went? I'm sorry? Uh, do you know where everybody went? Um, I think we're doing like a five minute break. Oh, so, okay. so I think probably just like water and the rest oh, of the okay. I guess. Oh, okay. You had walked out and then you came back and. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can see how that would be very, very disorienting. person I'm staying with likes to sleep at like 62 the temperature. How was it last time? Well, he gave me a space heater and I set it to like 75. <laughs> <laughs> I do not do well with the cold. You want mm -hmm. this? Yeah, yeah. yeah, let me move that. Hey, that's fine. seen that movie the quiet place yeah. okay well it reminds me of like the noises uh, oh okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the other thing that i was reminded of was this uh i think circuit court judge in like texas who wears his mic into the bathroom oh and no like i didn't know that. <laughs> really and the whole courtroom is like completely on their knees and like just laughing there that's horrifying i know poor person <laughs> And uh, like... Jess doesn't realize he's got the mic oh, on. No, Lord, why? And he walks into the bathroom to take a break. Oh, boy. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, then we'll give another minute or so. Share these links in the. In the um, Can I do the chat while I'm sharing my screen? Um, I think you should be. Yeah. I'm like Zoom illiterate. It's oh, you yeah, could just make a quick QR code. That's what I did. And just put it up on the screen. And people can... I do not know how to do that. Uh, there's a web page. I mean, just Google it, create keep a QR code, and it's but like it... a one minute process. Yeah. 
You know what's interesting? It's unclear to me that I like QR codes more than shortened URLs. Oh, I mean, yeah. No, but they need to. No, no, you can put in your URL. Yeah, yeah, but the problem is in call up, they're gonna load load the load the. Uh... That, you have some command for it. I saw. Right? You yeah. you have like a git clone and things like that. Yeah, but I'm just like unclear what. Oh, so you make yeah okay. Copy the image. Uh, download it. But that's like on the mobile. Yeah, I mean you. Oh yeah, yeah. No, never mind. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are gonna open it on the mobile. I mean, I imagine there's some connectivity between mobile and this thing. So. Oh yeah. Like there is, but yeah, there is. But it's. Okay, let, let, let me let me just paste this link in the chat. Okay. okay. Chat is a little annoying. No, no, it's, you know, there are the funny things that are yet to be solved. <laughs> like, uh, so. Yeah, I mean, like, I'll be honest with you. Right? Like, I like CS problems. I hate technology. And I feel like that's <laughs> a weird, conflicting thing. Um, I actually really enjoy not using my computer. <laughs> Um, should we get started? I don't know if Ahmad is coming back or if he had like, perhaps another commitment. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe we get started. I guess it's probably about the right amount of time. Recording in progress. Oh, sorry. Okay, I think we're, we're set right. Um, okay. Oh, 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 I see it, I see it. Was uh, are we I think I'm on? Okay, yeah, cool. I, actually, I just joined, I don't have the chat. Uh, oh, let me, but that's fine. It just take so, so, so let me just post, post it again. Is there a way to make the chat available to people from before? No, oh. you just have to post it again. So it, it erases. It's that's, not like that's a design flaw. Yep. Well, it posted it as an image too. That's so confusing. That's okay. not what I anyway, know. I have it now. Okay. Um, okay, so if you go to Google Colab, um, we'll load it from there. Um, and there's an option to load from GitHub. So if you put in that um, URL, which won't copy over here, there must be something about copying in. Uh, oh, when you screen share? In, yeah, copying from. PowerPoint, which is weird. You think we'll just use the clipboard. Oh, um, oh. Sorry, and once you do that, it should uh, bring up this um, notebook um, link. Um, it says tutorial one. I'm, I'm sorry to say there isn't a tutorial two, but I thought I'd have, I'd break it up in the end and just put it all in one. Um, okay, so if you just click on that, it should load it. Uh, and then we sh should change the runtime. Uh, change runtime. Uh, you, uh, the GPU. Um, doesn't probably matter all that much unless you want to fine tune because all the inference calls I'm not batching up. Um, so it probably doesn't make a huge difference. Um, but if you want to play around with the fine tuning, then definitely switch to um, a uh, GPU runtime. I don't think you need to have hit connect, but it looks like for me, I had to do that. It's kind of unusual. If you look at resources, then you should have uh, GPU. Okay. Um, and so I would run the first couple, like maybe run all the cells up until the compiler error section, and then I'll kind of guide a little bit on kind of like what this is. Um, yes, this is not, not authored by Google. You can run anyway. Like I'm not doing anything, you know, malicious. Um, so I'll, I'll just install a couple of things. Do you have a link to slides? Uh, no. Uh, do you need it just for this? Or yeah. I'm happy to share the link. Yeah, let me just uh, share this link here in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to share the slides after. I just don't have them uh, hosted anywhere. Um, yeah, so we copy that in. Uh, if you go to the, the, the chat. Um, I've pasted the oh, uh, chat, the Zoom chat, the Zoom chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, go to the Zoom chat. Um, and this link is what you'll want to use uh, when you go to Google Colab. So in Google Colab, you can just type in like Google Colab um, and then you can load from GitHub uh, and then you'll put in the, the URL for that repo and it should show you like uh, the fork. <laughs> Um, it'll just install a bunch of stuff. Um, we have one part of the tutorial that uses like a Rust based tool, so it has to set up Rust and a couple of things. Okay, so while that is going, all right, so let me tell you what this is and what it's not. Okay, um, it is maybe let's start by like what it is, right? So, my goal with this was to provide a bunch of different ideas. Um, very much like geared towards newcomers. So, so I think if you are familiar with this type of repair, you may not find this that interesting. Let me just mute. Uh, hold on. Getting experience in the neck. Oh, maybe not. Um, yeah. So, like, if you're very experienced with this, you may or may not find it interesting. Hopefully, you take something away. Um, but I think if you're not familiar with it, I do hope like you come away with like a, a you, setup. Could you post up the link in the chat again? Yes, sure. Um, all right. How about that? Oh, okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. So you go to Google Colab, then pick load from GitHub, dump in that URL, and then pick the notebook. Um, yeah. And then just run the first couple of cells where it's kind of doing some setup. Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah. So, basic understanding like a setup that you could extend. Um, and um, like I would view this as like I think if you did some of the extensions and they work well, I would think of this as like baselines for a paper on on this topic, right? Like probably not a new system, but certainly baselines. Um, okay, I think equally important. What is this not? Like I am not kind of providing you all with like state of the art repair systems. Like I think multiple of these you could get there with some time engineering and data, but we're not going to do that. Um, but they're basically ideas, right? You can feel free to grow them. Um, you know, the repo, all of the code we'll use is, is, is uh, kind of written from scratch for this tutorial. So I've kind of structured it in a way that I hope kind of makes sense to folks. Um, I think some guides. Um, so the notebook itself just kind of exercises code that we've written up in this little library. Um, so in Google Colab, you can actually edit also files um, so it might be easier to edit things there and then uh, re-import and kind of use it. Um, I've added a bunch of fix me comments like everywhere. Um, they aren't actual bugs, but they're places where I think you could extend this to be interesting, right? So I'll, whenever I introduce something, I'll talk about like extensions or things you could do to make the idea more sophisticated, more interesting. Um, you know, if I did that for everything, I'd probably be writing a tutorial and not doing my job. So that'd be a little hard. Um, so I just added them as like extensions, right? So you guys can like do it if you feel like that would be fun. Um, we'll probably have like an hour left in the tutorial where you just kind of hack around, um, or you can do it later. And if you have questions, you can let me know. If you have improvements, you know, feel free to pull it, put in pull requests, whatever you want. Um, and the third point here, yeah. So the other thing you'll notice is the tutorial is almost it's like a weird hybrid between the tutorial and the blog post. So my hope was like if people, you know, had to leave or couldn't. Do this online with us, they would be able to do this offline. Um, okay, so let me just, all right, so this takes a while, so maybe just like we'll keep installing and come back to it. So, but I think we can move on to kind of the problem statement. Okay, so, I think it helps a little bit to be very explicit about what we're going to try to fix. Um, and so, I think the setup is basically we have programs that are supposed to be in some language, right? Uh, in our case, they'll be C, but you could. Replace this to do whatever you want. Um, then you have some, you know, some Oracle that could be a compiler, it could be a type checker, it could be whatever you want. In our case, it's going to be GCC with some flags um, that tells you whether this program is, is well formed or not. Um, you also have a distance function, right, that compares pairs of programs in, um, maybe I shouldn't say in our language because the first one we're saying is intended to, but it's not actually in the language because it's going to be rejected. Um, and then there's some threshold for that distance. Right. And so our goal is like we have some program that doesn't satisfy this oracle. Um, we have to produce some derived program, right, um, that does satisfy it and is within some distance bound. Um, and um, 
So we'll make some very kind of practical choices for these, but you can imagine replacing the distance with something else, uh, you know, the oracle with something else and so on. Uh, but the setup is pretty kind of generic. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Is there an uh, upper bound on like how different uh, two accepted programs could be or like? Um, here, yeah, it'll be based on, it's, it's fairly arbitrary. It's based on the fact that we are going to call the token, the distance function just be like a token edit distance. So rather than string level, you work on the lecture tokens. Um, and we're arbitrarily going to say five edits. Um, I picked five edits because some papers have picked it, but it's usually kind of like the idea is like, can't do all that much to change the functionality of the original program in five edits. Um, and so it's kind of like a more or less popular bound. Um, it's not as clear cut because it turns out even with lectures, like depending on the lecture you use, you know, might get different token counts and things might get spelled slightly differently. And so the distance is a little different. So I kind of recommend, regardless of what, like run experiments automatically with these bounds, but at the end, like look at the repairs, and just like make convince yourself that you're actually doing something, something sensible. Um, before you report the results, that's usually so. Not. We should think about it as like we have like a budget of like about five tokens mm -hmm. change. Yeah, um, and uh, the more you grow that, you know, the further away you get. But like the general idea is like if you don't constrain the changes at all, like the extreme cases, you just delete everything and you get like an empty compilation unit, and you know. Like that happens. Like there, you know, there's certainly like program repair tools. You know, I think famously some that are like based on like genetic programming. Uh, sometimes the fix in their cases, they're, they're it's more like behavioral as well. Like you're trying to fix test case failures, but there, like sometimes the fix would be the the test case would be deleted, right? And so like, in fact, I mean that's not wrong. Like that, like that was well within like the realm of things it could do. But obviously, like as a user, you kind of want to constrain that behavior uh, away. So let's see. Okay, cool. So at least the first part installed. Um, technically, I pip installed the package, but I cannot get Collab to pick it up, even though it's in the list of installed packages in libs. No, no, you're most likely going wrong with the CD. So even I went through the same problem when I wrote to you. Yeah. And then it was just a matter of like changing the directory and making sure you're in the right directory. But I shouldn't need to be in the right directory because I pip installed it everywhere. Like it should be just available in the lib packages. Oh uh, no, I mean I, I do a pip install after like getting into the notebook. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know, but something happened and it works fine on my machine. And I'm, I, I know that that's probably not like a good thing to say. You know, it works on my machine, but <laughs> I did something. So hopefully it works on everybody's machine. Um, we know. We know soon. <laughs> uh, no, I, I I developed. So I use it in WSL though. So technically we both. Oh. Uh, no, I cannot write PowerShell to save my life. So, um, okay, cool. So, so let me just like take a look at like the files and just kind of show people kind of what's there. Um, so there's a readme. You don't really care about that. Um, um, you can ignore scripts to just like create data. Uh, repair holds basically everything we're going to work on. Um, engines. Each of these has a different repair engine. Um, my goal was to share kind of a fundamentally kind of different approach. Um, to repair in each of them. Um, I have some utilities. Uh, if you double click on stuff, you can see it and you can actually edit it too, right? So which is kind of nice. You know, I, I'll do it just to know up to kind of show you all. Um, utils has a lot of utilities for the project. Um, so you, you can take up these. Uh, we'll, I'll walk through the ones that are maybe more important or useful for kind of hacking on it. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, some of it we will use, some of it we won't. Like I said, my hope is like, if you're interested in this area, you could kind of take this code base and just kind of start building on it. Um, it's not as documented as I initially set out to. I have like type annotations maybe on like 75%. Um, but I'll, I'll try to kind of keep improving it so that people you know use it, then that'll be good. Um, Cool, and data, we have a couple of things. So one, we have a SQLite database, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, and I pre-prepared both a training and test split. Um, no validation split, because I don't want to make things complicated, but you know, please use validation um, in your actual research. Um, that should be 
Okay, resources. Yeah, some things here you won't really care about. Um, we'll talk about the things you don't care about uh, as we go. But we'll have a, I have a, fine, a version I fine tuned uh, for everyone um, for repair. And I have a couple of like parser generator files for one of the um, one of the tools we'll we'll use. Cool. Um, so let me talk briefly about the data set. Um, so this is um, kind of a very generous contribution I think, to the community for the authors of uh, DeepFix. So DeepFix is, I don't want to call it an old paper because I think it's ridiculous, especially because I think machine learning timelines mean nothing, right? Like people think things are old because they're like um, six months old, um, but it's certainly before, right? It's not transformer based. It's, you know, they use RNNs. It's kind of like, and before, 20, 20, 20, 20, it's like 2017 or something like that. Um, but I think it's a super neat paper. So like, I really, really, I put links throughout, like I really encourage people to take a read. Um, but one of the things that I think was quite nice is they, um, they released their data set, um, not just like what they had trained and evaluated on, but like the data set they derived everything from. Um, and so what they did is they, um, they uh, have an intro C programming class in, um, I mean, saying, sorry, we got a, like a, an emergency dispatch for this room for the lighting. Is everything all right? They said you guys had a meeting here at noon. This room? Yeah. Uh, no. Is you guys didn't meeting? call? Everything's no, all right? Yeah. No, but okay, I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Maybe there's another group at noon, but. Um, is there another group at noon? I hope not. No. Yeah, no. We have this room for the whole day. Okay. All right. Appreciate well, it. You guys are good. We're good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This making sure it's V507. Yeah. Yeah. Josh. Josh DePacco? Nope. No. No. Okay. Send that email. Right. Sorry, Thanks, Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so they ran, like I said, they ran a um, intro C programming class in, um, uh, in India. Um, and similar to what I was talking about with our collaborators at, at MPI, um, did some amount of logging of what students um, submitted. Um, and so they're solving you know, a whole variety of like intro C programming classes. Um, and so the whole, you know, I, I pre-prepared the data set, but I thought it could be kind of fun for people to look at like the actual uh, database. So it's a SQLite database. Um, it has probably more tables, but I think the only one that we care about is this code table. Um, it, these are all the student uh, submissions. Um, for each student submission, you have a user ID, um, problem ID, which I believe is like the assignment they're working on, a code ID, which is like a it's not listed as, oh no, it is primary. Okay, it's a primary key, so just like a unique identifier for the submission, uh, the actual code, um, an error message, and the uh, error, error counts. Right, so it's about, yeah, a little under 55,000 um, submissions, which is pretty nice. Um, I think it's probably one of the larger um, uh, student data sets I, I, I've worked with. Um, what is error count? Um, error count. Yeah, so it's, um, I think they literally just count how many uh, locations GCC complains about. Um, there might be some other definition for it, but it, it, it should be like how many errors um, GCC thinks there is. Um, one thing that's noticed, like to point out is like, there's this idea of like cascading errors where like really there's just one mistake, but the compiler will put, you know, like, you know, usually like with like Java, right? Like you get one thing, it's like this insanity and you realize it's like one little thing. Um, so, um, the same thing kind of here. Um, and so, yeah, so here, so we have about 6,000, um, a little under 7,000 programs that have some, uh, error. And so these errors are compile errors, right? I, I don't want to, we're not going to talk about, uh, uh, behavioral, like functional correctness. There's no test cases, you know, in fact, we're not even going to care what these programs are supposed to do. Um, but about 7,000 of them just plain won't compile. Um, all right, so this brings me to sort of like, if you're thinking about like the research workflow for these problems, right? You've identified some data set and you know, thank goodness these like wonderful uh, uh, research citizens have released into the world. Um, and you want to now create a data set for, you know, for your research based off of it. Too. Um, and so I think I wanna, and even, I guess, even if the data set didn't exist, this is kind of, I think a general point. Um, Typically, I think we've approached our problem where we, you know, you have to start somewhere, so you have to start collecting data. Um, I think there's two like very kind of complementary approaches. So one is just, you know, synthetic data. I mean, unsurprisingly, you can kind of produce as much as you want. Um, I think synthetic for our use case typically means 
you're going to collect a bunch of well-formed programs, um, which is what you would expect for the most part to find on public uh, sources because people aren't, you know, hopefully typically committing programs that have like compilers, certainly, you know, other bugs, but hopefully not compilers. Um, and so typically you can collect a lot of well-formed programs and then you can break them yourself. Um, and we'll talk about like ways to break them. Um, you know, there's limitations, obviously. Um, the way you break them will kind of limit the scope of what you can repair. Um, and so you, hopefully you'll break them in ways that actually correlate with the mistakes you're interested in fixing. Um, the ideal setting, which I know is like not available to everyone. Um, you know, even I think even within Microsoft, this can be kind of challenging sometimes. Uh, but really telemetry data, I think is like the best thing you can do. Um, right, so if you're running like a um, programming class, like I highly, you know, as long as you get all the right approvals and you get the opt-outs and, you know, make sure to anonymize things and like make sure to dot your I's and cross your T's. I really think there's a huge value in collecting student submissions because um, it's like one of the few places where you have them working on very controlled um, uh, problems in like controlled circumstances. You can restrict their to children, you can do all these things, right? So that, that's like a really wonderful source. Um, in production, like places like Visual Studio, Visual Code, um, there's a lot of restrictions on that. Like typically you can do it only in very certain circumstances. People have to be able to opt in and not even opt out. Um, it's super restrictive, but if you can get it, uh, and as long as you know you satisfy all the privacy and, 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 and legal requirements, it's, it's very valuable. Um, and really there's huge value in combining the two, right? Like you can start with synthetic data and like we did in the flame paper, you can figure out what are mistakes people actually make based on telemetry data and then, you know, create noise operators to break stuff like that. Um, so for our cases, I'm just gonna talk about um, synthetically breaking programs to create data because I think that's probably the most like easily transferable uh, approach to other uh, settings. Um, yeah, so, okay, so one thing, for some reason, imports take super long on what I've set up. I think it has something to do with my PyTorch imports. I haven't figured it out, but, you know, if you see imports taking a while, just, like, give it a little bit of time. Um, yeah, so I already pre-broke the data set because it's, you know, maybe not that exciting to sit down and look at that. But I did want to, like, look at um, a very simple, like, noise function um, um, that, you know, we kind of implemented for this. Um, so there's like just five different operations um, that will take uh, well-formed code and produce, you know, some uh, broken kind of version. Um, so we're going to, we're happy to remove a line, just like straight up delete something. Um, you know, we'll replace a line, um, we'll remove a character, replace a character, and insert a character. And you can imagine doing a bunch of other things, right? Um, so I think these are kind of pretty straightforward. Maybe they're not super work. Um, looking at, but um, anyways, for some things like inserting characters, which sounds like maybe not that useful, if you do things like insert the limiters, especially for things like uh, compilers, it does align pretty well with what people tend to get wrong, especially like beginners, like, you know, parentization, nesting, all this kind of stuff that they might make mistakes on. They might forget things like semicolons, right? Like that happens. It happens often enough that a lot of compile error messages typically suggest uh, that is a fix. Um, yeah, so, so if you were to, you know, uh, work on this for your own domain, you know, write a noise function that makes sense for you. Um, and I think my suggestion is usually you kind of build it up incrementally um, and you start adding things. Yeah, so uh, if you build in the, it synthetically, so you can control like how many mm -hmm. uh, tokens are uh, yes. grown. But here, uh, do we guarantee that we have enough budget to fix the... We do not. So we could have some yes. problems that we can't like yes. with only five changes. That's right, that's right. So, so I'll talk about the train test split. Um, the train split I'll constrain to the budget. Um, and when I'm inserting noise, I'll constrain it to the budget. Uh, actually, well, that's how I drive the train split. Uh, the test split, I'm just gonna take uh, student programs that are broken. And I don't know, because I don't have like the final version. I, I didn't pair it, like you could. Uh, and if you, if you have cases where you already have the real student solution, um, then that's like your natural ground truth. 
The challenge, though, I would still say is if you look at some of them, it's very often the case that a student will not just fix the compile error, but will go on and add more functionality. And so then, like the pair that you have is really probably actually out of scope for what you're trying to solve. So you probably still want to do some limiting. Um, here we're not, but yes, you're totally right that some of these might require more fixes than what we're willing to allow. I'm just wondering, like, hey, so what we should expect regarding like the, like, what is an ideal performance of so, but, um, but maybe it's out of scope for now. So. No, no, I, I think that's a good question, right? So I think you could just remove. Um, actually, so we'll, I'll, 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 so for the methods, at least for the fine-tuned one, because we're going to fine-tune on data sets where the pairs have a distance bound, it's probably going to try to, it's going to be biased towards fewer edits. Um, but if you just look at the like one of the metrics where we just check whether it compiles or not, that's probably kind of an upper bound given that number of edits. Some of the other ones don't have that uh, limit, and so maybe that's a good proxy for what you could fix regardless of the token boundings. Um, that being said, the non fine tuned ones you'll see just don't work as well. Uh, yeah. So okay. So like I said, I'm kind of littering little like extension tasks throughout. Um, and so the first very natural thing to try if you, if you, if you, you know, have the inclination for it is um, extending the noise operations. Um, and that sounds like kind of simple to do, but I think I linked to this very nice paper, um, very good fix it, that basically builds on this idea that if you break code in a better way, you can also fix code in a better way. Um, and so just to like give you like a summary of it, they basically, take a bunch of well-formed um, uh, Python code from GitHub and other public sources, and they happen to have some amount of um, uh, a malformed code, right? But they don't have pairs. Uh, but then what they do is they'll like just bootstrap um, a training data set by synthetically breaking some of the well-formed code, and they'll train a fixer. Then they apply a fixer to the malformed code, right? And if it happens to compile now and be within some distance bound, They'll, they'll just treat those as like ground truth pairs and have this kind of noisy supervision and they'll go back and forth and they'll train also a, a breaker, right? So you break the, um, so if you fix the malform code, you now have like real malform code and like derived fixed code. And if you train things in one direction, you can train the fixer. If you swap them, you can train the breaker. And now you take the breaker and you break well-formed code and now you get other pairs. And you just kind of go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and eventually you get like a much better uh, repair model. Um, so I thought that was really neat. Um, and it kind of builds on this idea that if you have good noise operations, in their case, you know, they're not symbolic operations. They kind of, it's a distribution kind of generated by a model. Um, but I think it really built on the idea that it can be a, a great way to, to improve performance. Um, yeah, so the training data, so, so this gets to your point. Um, we are going to constrain it to pairs. So we're going to synthetically break it. We're going to take well-formed student programs. We'll synthetically break them, and we'll only take pairs that are within our distance bound, um, just fairly arbitrary. Um, the test data, we're going to exclude any uh, other submissions for that same student and that same assignment, um, but they're going to be unlabeled. There's no ground truth pairs. We'll just see how many we can fix within our distance bound, um, but it's pretty pretty arbitrary. Um, so we have that does not work. All right, so we have about thirty thousand um, training examples, kind of more or less good enough to do some a bit a little bit of fine tuning. Um, and then I only did a hundred tests um, for no other reason than I think more than a hundred is probably a good idea, but we get a little slow. Um, so just to give you like uh, just a couple of like summary stuff stuff. Um, okay, so one thing you'll see is I, I don't parallelize anything here. So some things will take a little bit of time. Hopefully you can kind of you know bear with me. Um, let me just kind of click along. So the first couple I just want to like take a quick look at some of the data set, um, show you kind of like what we're going to be working with, um, and then go from there. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so the first thing is just like tokenizing it with like a language, like a C lexer, um, just to see how many tokens we have, just to get a sense of like the length of programs. Um, I actually, so one thing I didn't mention is I actually limit the length of programs going to work with, um, because for some models, like we'll have a token limit, so otherwise you end up with like just like a truncated program. Um, 
And we're not going to cover it here, but I do have some code using like Codex, and then, you know, it's pretty cheap, but you do pay by the tokens. So I didn't want people to like feel like, you know, like it was going to be annoying. So they're they're shorter programs. Um, right. So you know, most programs are somewhere around 120 tokens. So you know, probably a couple of lines of, of C code. Um, these are all the synthetic cases. You know, most of them have a single mistake. Um, Others and these are uh, mistakes reported by, by GCC, uh, right? And kind of, kind of tails off. Um, there's really no relationship between the number of tokens and the uh, number of mistakes, which is not surprising. We're just kind of inserting these kind of uniformly at random, so I don't really feel like there should be something there. Uh, but just to give you like a sense of some of the um, mistakes we've introduced in our uh, training set, right? So the first one here, you'll notice um, there's a typo. Right, the person has a inlued uh, preprocessor directive, which you know GCC have, will have no idea what to do with. Um, so you know the fix, uh, of course, would be to just rewrite that uh, to include. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, like I said, so you'll notice, like obviously, this is very synthetic, uh, or it was produced for a synthetic noise function, but you know, it's it's probably not like inconceivable that someone would kind of have a typo in a, in a preprocessor directive. Um, the next one, uh, we again inserted a random character uh, in the use of n uh, of this uh, in this uh, uh, branch condition. Um, n r you know doesn't exist. Uh, the function parameter is n. So when we added r, you know this will complain about some undeclared variable. Um, and so again, so you can kind of start to see that you know even some of our pretty kind of naive um, noise operators will result in things that you could imagine users doing. Uh, which actually takes me to like a small anecdote. So Martin, my advisor, like way back when in like 2016, told me like we should synthetically break uh, Java programs and then try to fix them. And I remember insisting, I was like, Martin, we're only going to learn to fix the synthetic noise. Like, why is this interesting? Clearly, I was like totally wrong, and Martin was like way way ahead of his time. <laughs> and he had a great idea. Um, so, you know, he'll be happy to hear that I, I now agree, I guess. Um, and here's a couple of examples of like the actual test cases that we're going to try to fix. Um, so let me see what's wrong with this one. Yeah, so here, like this person, you know, clearly has an extra return that doesn't have a closing parenthesis. So really this closed up the function uh, definition and all this extra stuff is just junk that we should trim off. And so you probably can get this in the five token count. Um, depending on how we count the spaces. I don't remember. I mean, typically you would try not to count spaces except in a language like Python where maybe that might actually be relevant. Um, and the next one, this student is a little confused, right? They think you can write a, you know, it's a kind of a, I can totally imagine someone doing this, right? Where they write an expression as a function uh, parameter. Um, and then there's a couple of other mistakes. They've forgotten uh, comma between the two arguments, the scanf, there's also they've also forgotten a comma uh, in printf, right? So, so I'm not going to like speculate. Well, actually, I will speculate. So, like, it seems like this person thinks you know there might be some like string interpolation or some concatenation being done in some odd way for like string scan up and printf. Um, but really, the fix is you know you should have parentheses there. Um, and then there's okay, I missed one actually. There's also an undeclared uh, loop variable, right? So, um, what I think is actually kind of funny, like if you look at GCC, it reports the printf mistake. But it does not report scanf because I guess technically maybe you could do some operation between a string and an array. But this is getting the address. So I'm not sure what this is. But GCC does not complain, at least initially. Um, I think if you fix the other errors, but don't fix that, it might actually still complain about that. Okay. So any questions up until now? Any maybe there are <coughs> any issues running like the lab thingy? So you probably understand correctly, all the code is in Python, right? Mm -hmm. For the repair. But we're actually fixing we're C, actually fixing C code. C. Yeah, right. And those are the only two languages for the like any more C code. Uh, Sorry, it was me. Yeah, no problem. I was just muting. That's okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I've written everything in Python. We're trying to fix C, and there's one tool that we'll use that's written in Rust. And if you actually wanted to use it properly, you probably write Rust, i.e., 
don't know Rust, so I just am going to consume like messages from standard out and like mangle them and do stuff with it. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll talk about it briefly, just I think it'll orient people with some of the utilities. Um, some of the um, uh, metrics, right? So I have a simple bad program, a simple good program, the bad one just is missing a closing parentheses for the function uh, signature, right? So if you compile it with DCC, you should of course get that the first one is, is bad, there's some error. You know, if you compile a, the correct one with DCC, you should you know, be happy, nothing happened. Right. Um, like I said, there's different distance functions you could pick. Um, we'll use token edit distance for no other reason. That's a pretty common choice, but you could do something else. Um, depending on the type of repairs that you're working on, that I think is a good thing to replace. Um, you know, if you're working on like refactoring stuff, um, you're probably going to want to use something like a tree edit distance where what you care about is like how many nodes you move around, not really what's like in that node, so to speak. Um, yeah, so I have a little extension task here. I, we probably, I don't know if this will be that interesting to folks, but I think it's interesting to like at least think about cases where you get different results depending on the distance function. Um, I think there's different use cases for those. And so just kind of keeping in mind uh, that would, I think it's helpful. Um, so I have some just like simple utility functions for people to be able to run benchmarks uh, easily. Um, so any class that extends this uh, subclass is a benchmark runner uh, base class, you can uh work uh with um we have like a little class for our uh tasks uh it's called repair task record um i don't know if you need to care too much about it but it just kind of encapsulates all the stuff that's in the sql life database um and just if you wanted to extend your own like little uh class here's an example of some you know my my bad repair where all i'm going to do is regardless of what you give me i'll return you know some well-formed uh, C program, but it has absolutely no relation with what you gave me, right? And so this will kind of run the benchmarks, um, and we will get some uh, results. Uh, cool. Um, and so I think this goes to your point before. So we'll we'll always report two things, like how many candidates compiled <clears throat> at different cutoffs, and how many of those also satisfied the distance function, uh, the distance constraint. Um, I mean, in this case, obviously none of them do, because right, I would have to rewrite programs completely, but they all compile because they're all well-formed. Um, I think one thing to like, just point out is like in practice, if you deploy the repair tool and you have a criteria like compilability and distance, you would always check your candidates before returning, right? Like you would just prune out everything that doesn't satisfy it. Um, I think for our purposes, it's we are not doing that. I'm just like, scoring things as they come. I think it's useful so you can see the different trade-offs between different systems. Um, I guess you always could, I could just actually accumulate and report those separately, but it would be a little more work. Um, this utils, uh, when benchmarks also returns like annotated predictions, like with what the prediction was, what the original buggy thing was, the compilation result. Um, and if you feel it's helpful as you kind of hack around on it, there's a little diff uh, where you can compare you know, what you had before, um, it's just Unix diff, um, right? So in this case, there's no relation between the buggy and the prediction, so it's just like a complete rewrite. Um, but, you know, between the bad simple where we had a missing parentheses and the simple, okay, where we added it, you know, you should see that the diff just adds this. Um, and maybe there's a uh, closing parentheses in it, or a brace that I didn't see that. Okay, any questions? I mean, up until it's kind of like set up. So I'm gonna hopefully just dive into like actual repair stuff now. Uh, just to clarify, does the um, function add noise work on any type of um, program language? Um, yeah, I mean those are pretty generic, right? So because it like it deletes a line, mm -hmm. inserts a line that it borrows from the program itself. Um, inserts a character. Yeah, so I think you could probably do that for most things. Um, but let's say, like, I think if you were, like, say, repairing Python, right, um, it would be very natural that people get indentation wrong. So you should probably have an operation to add indentation noise, right? Like, the closer you can get to things you actually want to fix, the better. Um, and some things you'll want to do, like, our noise operation just works on, like, the string representation of code, right? But really, you probably want to, like, for some things, Let's say you wanted to induce like uh, uh, uses before definitions, right? Maybe you would parse the, the, the program 
look at the definition location, find uses, and maybe swap that use before the definition, mm -hmm. right? Um, or you want to, like, there's a very nice paper from uh, Michael Perdell from a couple of years back, also in, like, maybe 2018, 2019, where he, him and his students fixed um, different uh, JavaScript uh, errors, and I think their noise function was basically, like, collecting a bunch of, uh, sorry, their data set was collecting a bunch of JavaScript calls, and their noise function was literally permuting arguments. Uh, and it turned out you could like fix a bunch of real bugs this way because people tend to get confused about argument orders. Mm. Um, so I think it's very like scope to whatever you want to fix, you should create a, a, a noise function that makes sense for that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Let me take a quick see. Okay, so for the first kind of repair engine, we're going to use code T5. Um, so if you're not familiar with code T5, it is a version of T5 that's been trained on code and natural language. If you're not familiar with T5, it's an encoder-decoder-based transformer model. Um, it's pretty popular uh, because, actually, I'm not entirely, it, it seems to be very popular and people use it because it does well with like multitask learning. Um, and a bunch of things. And for code, it seems to be like a good compromise um, because you get like code understanding from the encoder side and like code generation from the decoder side. Whereas like with something like CodeBird, you might just be stuck with like the quote unquote code understanding um, that you kind of struggle to do other stuff. Um, so I just have a little diagram that I borrowed from the Code T5 paper. Um, so I linked it as well. So if you haven't read it, it's a really nice paper. Uh, you can take a read. Uh, but it basically shows like they have different tasks, like they can summarize Python, generate Python, uh, do defect localization, actually. Uh, actually, this isn't, it doesn't localize the error, but it does do defect detection, like is it wrong? Um, you can refine, so this is kind of close to the repair um, setup. Um, and you can also translate, right? And you know, for all these tasks, because they're kind of doing this multi-task setup, um, you have these like little prefixes that kind of signal what tasks you're trying to perform so the model does the, the appropriate generation. Um, I want to talk briefly about like the pre-training uh, tasks for Code T5. Um, and so just to, like relate this to the earlier talk when I was talking about flame, right? I, it was this idea of like, you kind of want to have pre-training tests that make sense for your domain. And so in this case, the, the Code T5 folks are working, working on uh, code and not just code, they have this bimodal data set where it's code and natural language, right? And so you should, uh, create for training goals that make sense to that. Um, so they have some very nice things. So like one is identifier tagging. So like given a uh, sequence of uh, tokens, is this a program uh, identifier? Like, is this a variable name, a function name, so on, uh, right? Or is it like uh, a built-in keyword? Is it a uh, delimiter? Is it a constant, so on? Another one is this bimodal uh, dual generation going back and forth between uh, natural language and uh, the code, right? So this is very closely related to like natural language to code downstream tasks. Um, and they have two uh, uh, kind of masking tasks. So one is this mass fan prediction where you take some contiguous set of uh, tokens and you replace them with a mask. Um, and then uh, the model has to recover the original tokens. Um, and then uh, mass input, uh, sorry, mass identifier prediction, uh, it's kind of like what it sounds like you're replacing, you're masking all the identifiers and you're kind of recovering um, uh, what those identifiers were. So, okay, so I, I, this is like background on code T5, I don't think you need to worry. As far as everyone, or as far as we're concerned, it is a box where we put in code and we get completions. Um, cool, so there's a nice paper from maybe like a year or so ago, maybe a year or two, I, I'm not sure. Uh, my sense of time is really, really bad. Um, and they talk about like this idea that why are we all fine tuning models for repair? We can just use pre-trained models um, for repair as long as we frame the task correctly. And their idea is, you know, they're good at this, um, they're, all these models are good at this uh, kind of mass span prediction kind of task where you recover parts. Um, so why don't we use that to formulate repair as this like closed style uh, task? If you're not familiar with closed style, it literally just means like fill in the blank style of task. Um, and so what they, in their paper, they present a bunch of different ways that given a buggy program, 
you could mask things out in different ways to then produce a uh, uh, input for something like code five, get a generation for what it thinks that mask in is, and then you know find a way to replace it back into the original program as a repair. Um, so we've implemented like a super si simple version of that. Um, so if you in the engines code two five, there's this code two five close repair. Um, and so I'll just kind of like walk through the repair function. It's probably kind of what you care about. Um, the main idea is we're going to prepare the buggy code and we're going to take lines that are um, reported as buggy by GCC and we're going to repla replace them with a mask. Um, and then given this new transform code where the buggy line is now just a mask, we'll hand this to code T5, the pre-trained version, and we'll see what it generates, right? It's going to generate these like sentinel token for the mask and then the actual tokens that it predicts should have been there. We'll take those and we'll replace them back into our buggy program. And that's going to be our predicted repair, right? Um, and so like the first, and so I put a couple of fix me's, right? Like, you know, this one's maybe not that exciting, but it's just like something I should have done, um, which is you probably want to set the length of your generation to something that makes sense, right? Based on whatever you're masking out. Um, but we're not doing that here. Um, but I think maybe more importantly, let me go to the adding masks, right? So right now, the way I'm masking things out is like the simplest possible way where I'm replacing the entire line that GCC says is buggy. Um, if you go to the paper I referenced here, they have a bunch of different strategies. Um, and I think it's a matter of like trying them out, figuring out, I think some work for some settings, some for, don't, for others. So like, here's an example of how you might do this differently, right? Um, say you have a type error, right? Maybe all you mask out is the type, um, the, the, the portion of the variable declaration, declaration that has the type, right? Maybe keep everything else the same rather than mask out the whole line. Right now we mask out the whole line. Um, and so I just want to like show some of the examples you would get with that. Uh, a question about that? Yes. So we are uh, evaluating on the passing the GCC test, mm -hmm. right? but we're not checking any changes in the logic. Exactly. So let's say a solution that actually removes the line and by that yes. the program uh, compiles. Yes. Is valid? That would be valid. Um, and I'll show you an example where it doesn't remove the line, but it does something completely different. And yeah. it happens to be valid. If, if it's five tokens. <laughs> if it's five tokens. Yeah. So exactly, right? So um, this is a great point, right? So at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> So A, I would say this masking strategy is even more susceptible to that, right? Because you're kind of ignoring what was there to begin with, period. Um, but this is also just like a general problem. Um, and it can be even harder in cases where like the program is so broken, like you forget about the distance of the program is so broken, you have no idea what the user was intending. So like, it's not clear what it would mean to fix it at all. Um, so some of those, it's gonna be very subjective. Like I, part of the challenge for this is basically you want to get your top like three or five candidates to be as good as you can because users are never going to look past that, right? Like just no one looks past that. Like even if you look at like older code search papers, people only present like top five results because like no one cares. Um, once you go top, past top five, it's like some weird psychological thing. You just don't look at it. Um, I don't claim to be an HCI person, so I'm sure there's a better number than top five. Um, but the more results you present, it's actually like overwhelming to users. Yeah, and Google, I, I didn't notice this, but Google recently has changed up the whole, like uh, on its search page, it used to paginate the results and show like like page two, three, four, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now they've just completely removed it. Really? So you once- It's like an infinite scroll thing? Yeah, or? it's an infinite scroll now. So you it shows you the top, like what it was, six, seven results. And you if you hit that bottom seventh result, then it loads like two or three more. Oh, interesting. It's like a neat little HCI kit that they put in, which kind of relates to this. Yeah. Nobody cares after that. Exactly. Five, six, seven well, I, so I did a, a code search probably a very long time ago. And I remember I was talking to this, uh, it was Mike Kearns. Um, and he was doing code search stuff. And he's like, okay, cool, nice results. But like, why are you showing me top 30? Like, no one cares. I was like, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Truly, no one cares. <laughs> Uh, and then I went back and I looked at some HCI papers and it was like, well, <clears throat> nobody cares, like pass them. Um, I think this is the benefit of ChatGPT. GPT only gives you one. One answer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but that's a, like, that's amazing. But that's a, like at the interface side. Yeah. yeah. But like in the back, like you should be generating multiple things and doing stuff. Yeah. But yeah, at the user level, I don't think you should expose more than that. 
um, which is interesting. So for this close repair thing, we're going to use the base size of code 25. So this is 220 uh, million parameters. Um, like I said, I, I don't batch anything in part because actually no good reason except I didn't do it. Um, and I like to see a progress bar. And I guess I could have done it at the batch level, but I didn't. Um, but I get very impatient. So that's, I like to really see that's them. the kind of repair technology I pay for. So if, if I had like a non-batch yeah. program, it can actually- That would be nice. I, I would definitely do that. I mean, but the, the thing, the nice thing is a lot for that, like you could just do like symbolic rewrites, right? Like I don't yeah, need some neural thing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Um, Okay, so this is gonna be slow, so I apologize to everyone. Hopefully, you know, you can run it. Um, it should run predictions of the 100. Um, I didn't show it here, but um, any, you could pass in flags. So if you just look at whatever um, code T5 accepts through hugging face as decoding uh, name parameters, you can just pass them in. And so we just we generated predictions and now it's just like running them through GCC and uh, our distance stuff. And we'll look at some examples, at least one example of exactly what you pointed out, that it just does some like funky thing that makes no sense. Um, cool. Um, okay, so here, so okay, so the results here, you know, it fixed, it could get 36 of them to compile at top one, 41, so on. But if you look at the distance around, you know, much smaller. Um, to your point, it's unclear if those should be could be fixed if we increase the bound. You can certainly play with that. Um, uh, but you know, these are cases where you could at least suggest something to the student with like pretty few edits. Um, so hopefully they find that useful. Um, so yeah, a quick, quick question about what you mentioned earlier about like a localization. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about removing a line mm -hmm. because uh, just to see. Uh, sorry. So because the compiler found like an error in that line, but Earlier, you mentioned that it doesn't really. Uh, it's not perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, I'm, I'm just asking, like, for a hint, like, how should we depend on it? Like, yeah, that's a good question. So here, I'm gonna take it as given, yeah. right? Um, one way to do it is like, and so here, and I think this is true for these tests as well. Is like, we're framing this as like a one shot, like you need to fix it in one go, right? But really, iterative makes a lot more sense. And so what I would always probably do is I would like treat each GCC reported location independently, starting from the top, because that way you kind of tend to avoid these cascading errors. Just mask that one, try to fix it, run it through GCC again, see if it complains, right? Does it complain in the next line or is it somewhere else? Um, if you start to run into this like a lot, then I would consider offline training something like a pointer network that just points to a line um, and using that instead of GCC. Um, so I'm show, okay, so this is an example I had in mind earlier. Um, I'm happy that this is, you know, at least somewhat reproducible. Um, so you see the original student mistake was they forgot a semicolon, right? Um, after this modu the modulo uh, operation. Um, but because we masked out the whole line and then got code T5 to replace it with this closed style thing, you know, it did something somewhat reasonable, right? It used a variable, right? Probably because it's somewhere here in this branch condition, it set it to a constant and then, you know, indeed it solved the mistake and added a parent, uh, closing, uh, closing um, semi or a semicolon, uh, but it does like a completely different operation. Um, so this goes to the point that like, you have to be careful, right? So. This is, you know, within our distance bound, it does indeed satisfy the compiler, but it changed the user's computation. Um, and it's a direct result of our very naive masking strategy, right? So some ideas I, I wanted to pitch to people, like if you want to hack around on this, is just do better masking, right? Um, the paper has some ideas on, on masking strategies. They might be a little involved to like do, uh, you know, during tutorial, but one very simple thing you could do during a tutorial is rather than delete the buggy line, just comment it out. Right, and place the mask token right before. Um, and that way the encoder will have the context of what was there before. Um, and hopefully your generations will get a little better. Okay, the next step is we're just gonna run the exact same task, but with the smaller version of code 5 So this is a 60 million parameter model. Um, and so, you know, maybe unsurprisingly, we'll see that there's a, a, a drop in performance um, for, for the smaller model. Um, but we'll actually also fine tune the smaller model and we'll see that it, once you fine tune, you get better performance than you would with the bigger one uh, in 
just like in the pre-trained version. Yeah, sorry, the, the single example inference was a pretty bad idea. Very slow. In my defense, these are also K80, so it's going to be slow regardless. Slow enough, you can cut it on the CPU. <laughs> it's similar. Is doing this in the CPU or the CPU? Yeah, but like it's not batching anything. So if you look at like the GPU usage, I feel like Google Collab is gonna like get angry at me. So I'm not, I'm not even gonna look at it. Um, yeah, so you, you see like our compile, our overall compile thing went slightly down, right? So before we were like 36, 41. Um, at top five and top 10, it's similar. And I think this is something like we've observed a lot that like ranking, like bigger models don't necessarily expose a completely different part of the search space. It's more they have a better um, calibration at least. And so you get better generations uh, earlier on. Um, these are, okay, one thing to say, I, I'm doing beam, uh, beam search here. Um, you know, other decoding strategies might be different results. In general, like, that's also something we try to kind of experiment with. Um, and then the compile and distance, you know, metric goes down as well. Okay. Um, so the code, so the next section we actually fine tune. Um, so I did the barest bones thing. I kind of took the code T5 um, uh, fine tuning code just so you can kind of reference the original if you ever need to. Um, I, I don't do validation, any anything like that. I just literally save the latest uh, checkpoint and we fine tune for like four epochs maybe. Um, it, it, uh, eight examples per batch, and I think the way I have it set up on that block takes like maybe 40 minutes. Um, it's not super fast, but you know, good enough. Um, and so the way we're going to create our fine tuning data set, we create, we take our training data set. Um, we are going to prefix every input with the this like fix C uh, prefix. Um, I already showed it in the code T5 paper, uh, but in general, it's like good because then the model has like a good sense of what task. Uh, it's supposed to complete versus the original pre-training tasks uh, that it was trained on. Um, if you fine-tune on enough data, I don't think you probably need that little prefix, um, but I tend to add it. There's like no real downside. Um, okay, so like I said, if you want to fine-tune, you're welcome to it, but it'll take a while. I wouldn't do it now. Um, so for now, it'll just load the model that I fine-tuned offline. Um, the fine tuning here just uses code, uh, the input code and the output code. We're totally ignoring the, the error message. So I think like a very nice, like, simple extension here is to add the error message into the inputs um, when you're fine tuning, right? And maybe maybe you don't add the full message. Maybe just add like uh, the type of error or something. So I think there's a lot of things you can play with there. Um, that's probably the first thing I would do. Uh, you can of course continue fine tuning. I don't think that'll be as interesting. Um, and then if you decide to do some new noise operations, then I think fine tuning would be kind of a natural thing to do there. Um, so I just want to like show that there's kind of this nice jump in uh, performance um, when you fine tune. Was trained also on natural language? Um, so Code T5 is pre-trained on natural language, yes. Um, the fine tuning I just did like uh, the input code, output code, but that's the fact that it's pre-trained in natural language as well is why I think adding the error message is like a nice little extension. Um, so for some of the flame work we did where we just pre-trained on uh, code, like just formulas, adding error message made no sense. It like, and indeed it like didn't improve performance at all. Um, you could do something maybe. Uh, we tried a couple of things like adding like sentinel tokens for like different types of error message rather than the error message itself um, didn't really help a lot. But here, because you pre trained the natural language, I think it could be like probably at least helpful to make sure you're, it might help, especially because GCC messages sometimes actually have like predefined like suggested fixes, like, oh, you've missed the closing parentheses or you've missed the semicolon. 
right? So it might be like a nice way to integrate that without having to special case it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, guys, this is like super slow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe that's an extension task. You can you can turn it, you can batch it. That would be a helpful PR. Um, yeah. So okay. So we'll we'll do that, and then I, I want to just show this like quick comparison of solutions. Um, and I think we'll move to the second, which might be the final session, just based on how much time this is taking. I I, I had not gone through the tutorial before except on my own, so I'm not sure how far we'll make it, um, but we'll see. I have to say, I hadn't really used Google Colab before to share stuff, but it is convenient. It is. Like, that's quite nice. <laughs> no, I prefer to <laughs> move no credit. <laughs> the oh, problem course. is that the- But then you have to set it's up a everything. I, I'm more okay. interested in setting things, and also I prefer to have like my own, you know, yeah. layout and tools, and I have my own. Uh, yeah, but you're a grad student, you're specializing in this this domain. No, but like, let's say if someone wants to just come and like quickly, like, run it depends. It depends if you're like really working on something, so you want to oh, have the sure. tooling. Yeah, no, no, oh, I, no, no, no. So I would never work in Google Colab. I like, uh, I, I, <laughs> no, I, I don't like notebooks. Frankly. Yeah. yeah same um, same. <laughs> But I think the share stuff, I actually yeah. think it's pretty nice. Yeah. And I, I was not a convert before. I always kind of like, share as I think like talks and stuff. Yeah, like these yeah. 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 I think that it's nice. Especially if you have a uh, figures. Yeah. But I try to run it locally and like there are some uh, issues. issues. Yeah, for sure. Because I don't think I intend, I think I have a little local setup and I abandoned that. I like stuff. Um, yeah, if, if you want to run it locally, I can probably help out. Uh, so it's okay. I'll go with the call of this. Let's try to do the task, you know, we are here for something. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, so these are the function results. So obviously, you know, like a huge jump, and then the distance between the two metrics is much smaller. So this is like a direct result of the fact that our training data has this constraint on a number of minutes, right? Um, so, yeah, so at like top five, you're like fixing like 40 plus programs. Um, which is kind of nice for you know 40 minutes or however long I'm doing. Um, and I think if you added more noise operators that are like more like realistic for students, you know, I could see this get to like 60% uh, with some effort. Um, so one thing I kind of always harp on, um, so at, at, in our team pros, we have um, what we call research fellows. And so they're kind of like, a, it's like an AI residency style program, like after their bachelor's, before they choose to go to grad school, they choose um and so something i always like to tell them is like especially for this domain like you don't have to pick one hammer and stick with it right like the best thing is just like know the trade-offs and combine them um and so i, I liked i wanted to like have a little utility function to just like highlight this so for each of these it's basically at top one uh you can pass in whatever criteria you want but at top one the number of programs that like satisfy our, all our constraints like compiling and distance um, for each tool, um, the intersection across tools, like which ones are solved by all of them, the union, which I think is the most interesting one, basically, right? Like you could always run these tools in parallel and combine them and show them to users, right? And so that should be higher, it's higher than any individual tool on its own. Um, and then understanding like which benchmarks are solved like, exclusively by one of the tools, right? So, you know, unsurprisingly, like fine tuning. Uh, solves the most exclusively, but there are some benchmarks that, you know, even the small model gets um, that no other tool gets, uh, right? And so I think like, you know, if you're presenting, if you're developing your system, like obviously you'd want to get your number as big as possible. Um, but I think like, kind of like realizing that you can kind of treat these as portfolios of, of tools is kind of nice. But I mean, I think that's like what people with like SAT solvers do, right? Like they have like a portfolio that they dispatch to whatever they think will be the fastest uh, solver for their problem. Um, cool. Any questions up until this part? Maybe about the uh, the context window of uh, the file. The uh, small, the small uh, one. Like how much it supports or how much we're yeah. passing in? Um, I don't remember. I'd have to look. Um, code code bird is I think quite well, but code e five small. Yeah, the small version, I don't know. Is also around the same, same length, I think. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and we're so we are truncating, but I think because we've already constrained the size of the programs for the most part, we should hit. Uh, uh, but how do you do this otherwise? In, in let's say the published work that you were talking about, is there like a yeah? There's a truncation, in, but truncate as in you just like snip away. You snip away the rest of the tokens. I mean, you can that's, do other stuff, but that's what we tend right. to do. Yeah, no, that's that's been like super annoying in like actually taking these kinds of like, technologies to slightly more production grade like code. So yeah. one like one big solution, like one natural thing is don't. Do feed in the whole data. program, sure. feed in like localize the error and feed in like yeah. the encoded, like, you know, if you can do basic blocks the, in the, the containing basic block yeah. or the containing function or yeah, the yeah. whatever. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, in fact, like you might get different results depending on what you're doing. So this brings me back to like trying a bunch of them and combining results. I actually tend to think that's the best way to do these. Yeah. I think it's, it's also just yeah, no, it's also like a, I don't think you have benchmarks or like benchmark tasks to reason, let's say, into procedural stuff or anything of that sort. Yeah, so I also think about that like in the last days and also we spoke about it yesterday, about like if you can, and also like very related to neurosymbolic AI, that like if you can pack, like yes. you see like some lights and you can say, okay, that's a function. Yeah. And let, let me like write, define it as a function somewhere else. Yeah. But you know, then you, you can you like you represent really, that function. You, you, yeah, you can represent like more compactly. Yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, it might, be, it might be you could do stuff like, rather than define the function, all you'd have is like pre and post conditions for the function, right? Yeah. Include that, those should be much shorter than the implementation. Yeah. Right, and maybe somehow that stuff kind of gets you, um, Kind of like combinations of, uh, uh, of, of of the best of both worlds. But I think there's a lot of stuff like that to explore. We we have not done that. Yet. Um, so let me move to the next section just like in the interest of time. Um, so okay, so we've been doing like a purely neural solution, like one that's pre-trained and then the fine-tuned version. So I wanted to do something that's like purely symbolic. Um, and so I wanted to like point out like there's obviously like a very close relationship between the type of repair we're doing and like parser error recovery. Um, and so if you look at some old, some parser tools, they implement like what's called like panic recovery. And it typically just means like delete a bunch of tokens up until you hit something that you can start parsing. Um, but there's more sophisticated recovery that you can do. Um, like you can do some backtracking, you could like decide to delete, insert and update things. Um, so you obtain something that's parsable, but is minimal. And so there's this very nice library uh, implemented in Rust that does this. Um, and so I don't want to delve too much in this and some of it, like, I think everyone here is familiar with context free grammars. Right? Like, I don't feel like I need to cover that. Um, plus yesterday, I guess, uh, Ming Hao kind of covered it a little bit. Um, but so anyway, so we can write, a, a grammar and lexer. Um, so the tool uses actually a parser generator, and so it takes like a definition for tokens for the lexer and the rules for the parser, and then produces like a parser for us. Um, this is a simplified version of C. Um, I called it mini C. Uh, why is it a simplified version? It turns out like the yak files that Jerem tools takes aren't actually exactly like normal yak files. There's something, there's some weird stuff and compatibilities. So I couldn't just take a, a C yak definition offline, which apparently there's not very many of also. It's kind of weird. Um, so I decided to write my own. So I'm not covering everything. Um, you'll see there's a bunch of well-formed C programs that are not accepted by this grammar. Um, but let me move along. Um, yeah, so we're gonna use, there's a tool within GRM tools that does like parser error recovery. So it'll basically start parsing things as long as they fit our grammar that we've defined. If it doesn't, fit the grammar then can do uh, edits to get it to fit the grammar. Um, and the edits will be inserting of tokens, deleting of tokens, updating of tokens. Um, and their guarantee is that whatever set they return, there can be multiple sets of edits is uh, minimal. Minimal uh, in, them, in the sense of like number of operations. Um, Right, so I just want to kind of show you all that the, so I sampled 200 programs from our training set. I'll show you that the parser, the grammar we've defined does not cover all of them, but it covers like 75%. So at some point I kind of moved on. You guys are welcome to, 
to extend and you know refine the C grammar, I'm not going to do that. Um, okay, so as it uh, in download, so, so how can we benefit from the mini C? I'm not sure I. Yeah. yeah so 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 with mini C, we can plug it into this parser generator tool, right? Um, so this parser generator tool will parse programs according to this grammar we've given it. And if something raises a syntax error, it'll fix it. Um, it'll produce a, a, an edit so that whatever is produced is guaranteed to satisfy the grammar that we uh, provide, right? And so the idea is some syntax errors, you can just, you can fix this way, right? There's no reason to make any kind of like neural prediction because you have a grammar, you could derive like what are the edits that I could make so that I'm guaranteed to satisfy this grammar. So wouldn't it be true to say that you have that way less control on like the distance? Um, in this setting, well, you have your this tool at least guarantees that whatever it gives you is like one, it, it's minimal. So you couldn't actually reduce, you couldn't make less fewer edits and get it to fit the grammar. Um, you can make more edits. And so, yes, like it, it, you lose control in the sense that you're always going to get this minimal set. And it might be that if you made some more edits, it's actually more like what that user actually wanted. Um, but, but yeah, this, this tool, that's just like a trade-off for it. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. So this tool, so I wrapped it again in a different engine. Um, if we look at the function, all it does is it uses, it, it basically in, it iteratively applies this parser um, recovery tool um, to produce edits that are applied to the code. Um, I do it incrementally because it can technically suggest that it's at every location where there's an issue across different lines, but then you have to um, adjust the things to like account for changes based off of the prior edits, it got really complicated. So it's just one edit at a time, one location at a time, and just calls it iteratively. Um, right, so, okay, so they're all just kind of run and we'll see what that. Do we get some uh, credits for encoders? Unfortunately, I don't have credits I can offer. Um, there is a section on it. And so what I've decided is like, people, if you're interested, it's all set up. You can, there should be like a trial version. Um, I have a personal account and I think I've set a limit to like five bucks, never hit it. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure how they do some things because it always says the key has never been used even though I've used it. So I think maybe if it's some under some minimum number of tokens, they don't even bother, uh, but I don't know. Uh, okay, so cool. So here, you know, the reason, so, you know, only, we can only fix about 26 programs compiling and, you know, the distance is pretty close because of this minimal edit guarantee for the tour. Um, and so, you know, if we look at the number of programs, we actually returned a result for about 76 of them. Um, and so the gap between 76 and 26 is the fact that our grammar isn't actually C. It's just something kind of like resembles it close enough. Um, so there's some programs that are actually accepted by our grammar, the mini C things that are not valid C programs. Um, you know, so about 50 of things that we produce, um, which are mini C are not in fact C. Um, I think it's more interesting maybe even to look at the, um, uh, at the issue. So, Part of it is grammar, but I think the other part is actually, we're only, because it's a parser recovery tool, it's just fixing syntax, but C checks a bunch of other things, right? Like type correctness, or at least the type checker runs. Um, and so here you'll find like there's some variables, you know, this program is syntactically valid um, because syntax doesn't check whether, you know, variables have been properly defined, the type checker has to check that. Um, and so when it gets to this variable, you know, GCC rightfully complains there's an undeclared variable, right? And our parser recovery tool will like never fix that. Like it's just not within its design space. Like that just doesn't happen. Right, so if you look at all the things that we failed, there's 34 programs that fail because there's some undeclared or invalid type uh, resulting. Um, 
this always brings me to the fact that like, again, you should always kind of, you can pair these tools, right? You can fix syntax with a symbolic approach and then, you know, go back and run it through code V5. And maybe now you don't mask everything. You just mask uh, the parts that have type errors and then you get predictions. And kind of that brings us this idea of like pairing symbolic uh, systems with neural systems. Um, this is just an example of a bad, this is just bad mini C grammar. Um, I didn't actually, in my file, my parser rules, I didn't uh, specify that functions actually require braces for the body. Um, so it's trying to produce some function definition kind of in line, you know, C will not accept that. Um, yeah, so very quickly, I'll just cover this. Like I said, we won't be able to run it here, but I have set it up. So if you want to try it at home, you know, knock yourself out. Um, you just need to get a key, you know, toss it in. Um, I've set up like a wrapper on the codex engine just for, for our uh, task. We'll sort <coughs> completions based on uh, average log probability of token, tokens, which is pretty decent for repair. Um, Can you just run it with your key to see the result? Or is it yeah, I didn't set it up beforehand, but I already have the completions here. I, oh. I, did, it, I did it ahead of time. Cool. Um, so there's a base repair engine that literally is all just like commenting, like, you know, fix this bug and you kind of tell it what domain and that can kind of work for some examples. Um, you know, I kind of ran this ahead of time and here's one of the programs that had an issue. I tried to pick one that was kind of interesting. So the original program is the one I pointed out that had this like expression in the function parameter definition. Um, and it had that scan F and print F errors. And so if you look at what Codex predicts, you know, uh, it fixes the for loop uh, declaration uh, for the iteration variable. It fixes the calls to scanf and printf. But if you stare at it enough, you'll realize that it actually, and it fixed the function parameter, but actually also rewrote the function, right? So I think, um, so I you were asking about this before where you get like weird yeah. behavior. So if you compare the two functions, the user actually did have a mistake. So. So if you go up, you know, go to Wikipedia, look up Catalan numbers. I did not know what they were, oh, yeah. but there are some recursive yeah, yeah. Uh, number definition. Um, yeah. And this person got the base cases. So their base case was wrong, right? They have this n plus one. You know, maybe they got confused because of the function. Maybe they're doing it one base instead of zero base right. or something. Um, and so maybe that makes sense for them. But their second, the recursive case is just objectively wrong. Yeah. They're confused about the order of operations, right? So this will create this division and then add this, right? Just like by grouping of operations. Sure. Um, but that's not the definition. The right definition is actually uh, this, right? This yeah, n exactly. plus two yeah. should be yeah. sacra. And so Codex fixes it unsurprisingly because Cat Catalan probably yeah, created enough the, yeah, yeah, programming yeah. tutorials, yeah, yeah. you know, lead code, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we fix it. Yes, it should satisfy our compiler, but there's a huge edit distance, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, it's actually right. It's the right thing to do, but it is kind of an out of scope edit. It's not what we were intending to do. Um, then there's some other uh, cases here. Uh, what's this? Oh, no, this is just a diff. Oh, sorry. I have this little thing. Can you guys see it? Yeah. It's because I hurt my wrists like a year ago. So I try to take breaks. Um, you want to take a break as well? No, no, it'll take two seconds. We're almost done. Um, the next version adding error localization, right? So you can just add in the GCC compiler uh, message. More important, more interesting stuff is adding like few shots to the prompt, right? Examples of the types of repairs you want to do. Um, so I created these little classes that are kind of very generic, like codex with few shots, and you pick uh, different approaches to select the few shots. They can be fixed. So if you have a restricted domain, you can curate the examples yourselves. So that actually works pretty well. Uh, random doesn't make much sense, but it is an alternative. Uh, the more likely one is you want to compute some similarity. Uh, so the implementation here is uh, using Codebert to embed the um, uh, GCC messages, um, then retrieve something with similar uh, uh, with similar return another example with similar GCC messages. Um, why Codebert? Because I think I did this before I set up Code P5. You could also just use the encoder of Code P5. That would probably work pretty well too. Um, yeah, so here's the embedder. Um, so yeah, so I'll just kind of skip this. Um, so this is kind of one case I want to point out. So you know, here because of the number of token limit that we have, we actually generated a partial program. And so if you try to run this with GCC, it'll complain. 
So it just points out, I think, that you kind of have to be a little careful uh, when you're using these tools to like, you know, make sure you set up things that make sense for your use case. Um, a list of things that matter with, this isn't just for codex, but I just want to highlight it for codex, like, you know, the temperature, how you're sampling, is the temperature sampling, nuclear sampling, so on. The number of candidates matter. Um, and I have some extension tests for codex that people want to try them out, things like, you know, repetitive or iterative repair. You could fine tune code bird so that the encoding it produces actually is relevant for repair rather than just like whatever it was retrained for. Um, better ranking, you can train dedicated rankers. Um, and I put a link to our paper, the one I presented that it actually uses codex for repair. Um, that's it. So like, do you have some benchmarks? Uh, yeah, so those, um, because yeah, so there's some public ones here. Yeah, I feel like it's it's like a unfair competition here. Like the models sizes, like the, the complexity, like yeah. So there's a trade-off. Uh, orders, sure. and like by orders. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so here we have some Excel benchmarks and some Power FX ones. The other ones are also from public sources, so we just like reference the original repositories. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I can, I'll actually, this is a good addition. I'll add it to the, uh, to the tutorial and just push it after. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Cool.